Hey, this episode of the Live Q Die podcast is brought to you by Tackle Distributors. I'm here with Todd Askins. Todd, thanks for sponsoring the podcast. Tackle Distributors, you already know you can get everything you need. I got some new underwear, some battle briefs, my favorite. I've got a Hawaii trip coming up. Maybe I can grab some of these. Oh, I like this one too. Uh, I'm going to Colorado with Todd. I might as well grab a jacket. Uh, I mean, this will probably work too. Uh, I need some accessories. It's probably going to be cold here. And just for good measure so I don't get shot. It looks like it's going to be a lot, but it's not. I'm going to use Impossible 15. I'm going to get 15% off my purchase. It's going to be great. I like when you're here, Jay. Here I am. You little ray of sunshine in my life. <laughs> it's like having one of my daughters on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> just, just make me smile, make me happy, and sarcastic. You're the sar. You're, you're what, what's her name? D, the sarcastic sister on Good Times or whatever. I that, that's you. Um, you're all. You remember Good Times? The show Good Times. Yeah. I grew up overseas, so oh, I had, so you didn't I, see it. I was deprived of, of, of a lot of American culture as it, a child. It was like, J.J., I think was his name, if I'm not combining shows from this old memory, is like, um, Dynamite. You know, was that Good Times? Was it? Yeah, I think it was, wasn't it? Was He's the dude. The, D's little sister. What's the, the moving, on, what's the moving, on, up, moving on up one? Uh, That's the Jeffersons. Yeah, wasn't he on the Jeffersons, J.J.? No. All right, I don't know. So our, our buddy Bill Rapier is here today, who I just, we sat down here, and it looks like Mike V., of skating fame, oh, Mike Valley, love Mike New Jersey Mike. badass. So, Bill, we we're telling you, you don't know who he is. Haven't heard of him. Well, you bet you're you missing should. out. So, in, in in the world of skateboarding, he is uh, this is he kid. Tony Hawk level, or yeah, he was on the same team. Yeah, oh, no kidding. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so he he's he's that level. Uh, but he skated street mm -hmm. more. So okay. he's one of the first like street kind of crossover skaters. But he there's this great video. So he played as an adult pro hockey. And he's just a tough dude. And what he was skating at like a gas station or something one night and like a Jeep full of like drunk dudes started mocking him. Yeah. And there's there's video of this on YouTube, how we should show it. It's such a great video. We can and the these are adult dudes too, and they get out giving them some shit. And it's like four or five guys, and he beats the shit out of all of them. Yeah, he rips on it, video. He rips his shirt players off. are tough. Yeah, he rips his shirt off and smokes all of them. And he hates that video now. I know, because now, like, he's lived in California now most of his life, moved there, and he's, like, 17, and is married to this hippie, and so he's become, like, a vegan, and he's all, like, you know, peace, and I, I, great dude, far less interesting not being a badass now. But I haven't been on a, the, so the last time I was on a mini ramp, so I, I grew up, when I lived in Germany, I skated, like, that, oh, that really? was my life. Was it big Love, there? Yeah, oh. um, we had, well, it, it was kind of growing, and then, uh, the second place I lived in Germany, we had a, a mini ramp, like less than a mile from my house. So I'd skate there every day and, you know, skate. And then we moved to Africa and a lot less skating yeah, going on in not, Africa. Not a skate scene there. Really. No, no. I mean, dirt roads everywhere. But then I uh, hadn't skated in since I was a kid. We we're on a deployment in Afghanistan. It was a little bit, most of the deployment was a little bit slower. Uh, I was off kind of in the countryside someplace for, uh, for, for the majority of it. And then we had some stuff spin up, so we had to come back to the base. So some of the Air Force guys that were, uh, that were associated with us uh, had built a mini ramp while I was gone. So I, I, no I pull out of our – Air Force I, is I, cooler. I, I park. I get out of our armored Hilux. I've got a, a SIG on my hip and a Serpa holster. I've got two frags hanging off of my belt. I've got a med kit. And I walk over. I probably had some mini Belgian mini frags in my pockets as well. I walk over. I see this. I see this mini ramp. Guys are skating. I'm like, give me that deck. <laughs> Drop right in. Still, like, you know, was able to do some some grinders and whatnot. And then over the course of the next few weeks, as we were, you know, we're doing kind of lots and lots of mission planning stuff. Uh, and anytime I had a break, I'd go grab a board, really? and skate. So and by the end of those couple of weeks, I was doing frontside backside airs, layback rollouts 
you know, 50, 50 grinders, like all the stuff that I was doing as a kid, as a kid? I, I was doing again, which was super, super cool. That's so amazing because in my experience at advanced armament, I had a mini ramp, a huge mini. It was so beautiful. Most beautiful ramp in the history of the world I had a 20 foot wide, four feet tall, like just beautiful, perfect ramp. And so a lot of our business at advanced armament was special operations guys. They come to the shop a lot. And there was so many times. I would hear a story like you told. Oh, I skated when I was a kid. And, you know, my board would be on the ramp over there. And I'd be like, you shouldn't do that. And generally what happens is they drop in, and in the flat they end up airborne on their back. Bam! It's like, yeah. A little yeah, lean back. Yeah, you're not, <laughs> you're not 12 years old anymore. Um, well, that that's all. Where are you, Maybe you if skating there's time. now? No, no. Oh. I, 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 literally, that was the last time I skated was Afghanistan oh. and Shkitsch. Mid mid two thousand. Should build. You got all those kids. You should build a ramp in Idaho at your place and get we your ski, kids skating. We, we ski and snowmobile. There's uh, there's other things. Yeah, but sometimes you're at home and you don't want to go. You know, skiing and snowmobiling. You just want to do drop that in. from my home. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's cool. kind of cool. Yeah, that's cool. What about the summertime? You get yeah. Skiing? No. So anyway, so Jay, Bill, so? I, Bill Rapier, possibly the best last name in all of the special operations Agreed. history. Like, that's terrifying. Agreed. Now you're old and retired and doing training. I am. So you've been able to stay in the community. So um, I did some reading and um, watched a podcast with you with, uh, what's his name? Andy. 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 Yeah, Andy Stump. Andy Stump. Yeah. And and so I, I learned a bunch there that was interesting from my perspective. Your parents were missionaries. You lived in a bunch of places in the world, which you just said, Germany and Africa and all this cool stuff. So yeah. you ha- had an interesting upbringing. Joined the Navy out of high school. 17. Yeah. And so how old when you went through BUDS? Started at, I just turned 18. Jesus. Okay. So uh, Navy SEAL, and then you end up in development group for a long time. Yep. A little over 14 years. Uh, uh, that's a long time. Yeah, that's a good, good and, run. And that's where you retire. I did retire out of there, yes. Most of your training now. So your company now is Amtac? Amtac is Shooting. The, so, but most of it is like practical stuff, concealed carry. Absolutely. That's, that's, what that's kind of what on. I'm most passionate about. I mean, we teach, uh, we kind of teach the full, full gamut. I mean, everything from, you know, how to draw and shoot your pistol to how to throw a punch to how to use a blade to how to run a carbine uh, to some environmental stuff. I do, you know, once or twice a year, I'll do some stuff where we actually do some skiing and snowmobile and then medium distance shooting all kind of mixed in. Um, all the way out to doing precision rifle work. Uh, I really enjoy the the variety of all those things, but honestly, probably what I'm most passionate about is just the, the what we call pistol combative. So being able to run a pistol, being able to fight, being able to use a blade, and, and being able to do all those things uh, as situationally and tactically appropriate. Well, okay, you said a couple things there I'm curious about. So... Is the snowmobiling and skiing, is that just, or that part of it combined with guns? Is is that just for like a recreational thing? Or, or what do you see the p- purpose in that? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so it's, it's a bolt. It's, it's, awesome. it's a winter kind of the way, the way I describe it. It's winter mobility. It's, you know, it's one of the things as the kind of that modern Minuteman concept, we should be able to have mobility, especially in the, in the environment that you live in. Uh, well, if, if it snows a lot and you're in the mountains, you know, skiing is, can be one of the most viable options. And then snowmobile would probably be the next most yeah. viable option. So oh, okay. just trying to get guys into that, Hey, this is how you do mobility, uh, on your own. And with that, we'll do some, you know, we'll, we'll teach guys how to build shelters in the snow and, and actually camp out and, you know, it, yeah, plus okay. it is fun. I, I really enjoy doing that. Yeah. I mean, I understand now living in new England the importance of some of that survivability of the winter. Like I, I have no idea how people lived here in 1623. Like, Lots we'll of get, firewood. We get 18 inches of snow in a day and it's like, how in the hell did people survive? Like, why would you live here back then? But, but they were able to, but you're, uh, you were tired to outside of Coeur d'Alene somewhere. Yeah. Is that right? North yeah. Idaho. Yeah. So it's so beautiful there anyway. Like who wouldn't want a snowmobile and ski there? I don't know. I mean, you watch Ivan. So we have a mutual friend, uh, yeah. Ivan Kit Badger. Shout out to him. Um, he lives up there, and his videos are awesome. That yeah. was one of the first things when I saw his videos that attracted me to it. It was a different approach, and I'm like, oh, my God, it's so beautiful there. It's one of the yeah. most beautiful places in the country. He's one of those guys that uh, is always up for an adventure. 
He's I he's he's one of the guys, one of the few guys that I can call pretty much day in or day out and say, "Hey, buddy, you up for uh, you up for going and and trying to ski twenty miles on on our own power? You know, up up and down." And he'll be like, "Sure, let's go, let's go do it." Yeah, so, he, he's a man. Yeah, we've had we've had some good times. Yeah, I like him. He's super interesting, but I th- I think you're right. Like he, he's a man's man, can do a lot of things, and is extremely tough. God, I want to be that fit one day. I, I need Jay. You and I got to get that motivation. I don't know what's Good going Idaho. on. Come on up. Know. Come up for a visit. Oh, we should. So, doing doing all that is interesting too, because um, I hear a lot of people doing training say some of the things that you said. But you're actually you're a black belt in jujitsu. I am. Un, under who? Gustavo Machado in Virginia Beach. But so, you, were you a black belt before you retired? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. okay yeah. So you've been retired seven seven years. So. Yeah. Okay. So you train out there regularly? In Virginia Beach, not a whole lot. No, or, I mean, in, in uh, Idaho. I, I'm teaching kind of our, our own crew. So yeah. we started a program shortly after I got out there called Father Son Ministry. And basically it's uh, it started off as we do 45 minutes to an hour of jiu-jitsu. And then we do a 15, 20-minute Bible lesson. And then we would do another hour or so of life skill. So... Basically, if you went down a list and said, what should my boys know when they're men? Everything from shooting, you know, fighting, primitive shelter, fire, getting your car unstuck. Like if, if you can put it on the list, it, it's part of what we do. So, Sounds like the old Boy Scouts. Exactly. Like what, and that's how I'll describe it to people. Is it, it's what Boy Scouts was at one point and should be. Um, and so that's kind of morphed a little bit because that was taken up like, three three and a half hours and we had younger boys there and so now it's really we'll, we'll pick one of those skills we'll do some jujitsu and then and then do our bible lesson or we'll go hiking or camping or, or something like that but that's been a great uh so i get to roll with some of the dads that are there yeah. so some guys train and then also now we've been doing it for shoot seven almost seven years now and so some of the the boys that were you know, they were boys oh. when they started and they're young men now. And yeah. so those guys actually will, will, uh, at least cause me to sweat a little bit now. Oh, so that's awesome. Yeah. Are you a, are you a Kali guy too? Yeah. I, know, I, was so say, I, I started guys... doing uh sack Kali, uh, back shoot. Oh, six ish. So that, that's been a huge, and those guys have had a, a massive impact on my life as far as the, you know, a lot of the mindset stuff, a lot of the blade stuff, a lot of the, you know, combat. Oh, that's the knife fighting stuff. Yeah. That would be the, the, from from the Philippines, yeah. The knife stuff, I always I always wonder about, like how. I mean, I guess it is probably more practical. It's easier and everything to use conceal than a maybe to conceal. I don't know about use, but well, I think it's super hand super hand. good to know. But I don't. I want all the way away from it. So the thing, knives are the scary. thing is they they're very complementary. If if we talk about weapons retention devices, having a blade on your other strong side, one of the best weapons retention tools that you can have because it immediately, you know, instead of the, you know, current, unfortunately within, within law enforcement, guys are still being taught to, you know, put both hands on top of your gun and then, and then circle away from, <laughs> from the guy that's attacking you, which is absolutely insane. So he can slam you on if your you head. Can, yeah. I mean, you, you end up getting crushed that way. If you, you learn, okay, I can, I can anchor, off of my, you know, control your weapon. And then I still have this hand that's free to either punch the guy in the face or deploy a blade. And it's so much easier, especially what, you know, for women. Um, that, that's one thing is I, so is our kind of our, one of our biggest missions within Amtec shooting is help good Americans be able to protect themselves and their families better. Um, so I used to do, I used to do more of the ladies courses. I've kind of gotten a little bit away from that just cause there's, there's less interest from, from women in, in, in doing that. But, I kind of moved away from doing more firearm stuff to doing more more blade stuff because I every class I'd go all right how many of you ladies carry a gun every day and it was almost zero I think yeah. there was like one or two of of all the different ladies that I taught that actually carried a gun every day and so then I looked at it and I go well if my mission is actually to help you protect yourself better and we spend the majority of the time that we have together on the range shooting but then you don't ever carry a gun like what does this actually help you. So I, I completely changed the way I, well, the way I taught them. And, and I would start by just the first 20 minutes was, was telling them, hey, if all the guys that have ever told you you can just kick someone in the groin and run away, like that, that's your move, like they're lying to you. Because guys that are serious, that doesn't stop them. If you think you're going to eye gouge and run, a, a serious dude, like you're not going to do that to them. As soon as we put a tool into your hand, 
they have to respect that. Right. And so I started doing a lot more blade stuff with the ladies because it's something also it fits their lifestyle more. Right. It's hard to make a girl that likes to wear yoga pants and, you know, tight fitting things to now all of a sudden go, well, wear all this baggy clothes so you can conceal a pistol. Yeah. But you can give them a blade and a nice, you know, thin Kydex sheath. And now that's something they just clip on. They don't even realize it's there. But it gives them an awful like if you if you go and, and mess, you know, if you're assaulting them and they get a blade in hand, like they absolutely have the ability to protect themselves. I completely agree with this. And, you know, for me, it could never replace a firearm. But what I find with a firearm for my own laziness is I carry one so infrequently because it's inconvenient and uncomfortable. Um, but We need to train together because I will try to, to change. I'll try to change that. We should. I, I mean, the thing is, like, I, I just need to change my whole life, basically. But a knife is very easy. And I use it, and I also use my knife like 10 times a day for something. I mean, usually it's like opening mail or Amazon packages, but it causes me to have a knife and it's not inconvenient. It's not heavy. I can ignore it. It's not uncomfortable. So I I, I think that is a good approach. But, you know, most of the guys, I I think, you know, there's lots of guys out there doing training and a lot of it, you know, it's obviously with our industry, pistol, you you know, or, or carbine or whatever. It's always firearms based. But the idea of, yeah, Americans being able to protect themselves. Yeah. There's obviously a market for that. And it's, yeah, firearms like shooting guns is very sexy and, but knives are horrifying and it is easy. I mean, it is easy to carry a knife. It's easy to get a knife. It's easy to conceal a knife. It's easy to ignore it when you don't need it, but know it's there when you do. Well, with a knife, know, too, like, like if you have the, those fundamentals and you have that, the ability to use a knife to, to defend yourself, if you don't have a knife, you can find something like it. Like you can find mechanical pen. pencils. Exactly. You can find yeah. something like it and at least have those fundamentals and that foundation and, and be able to protect yourself with it. So two, two points that I'd like to speak to. First off, uh, the, the blade never replaces the firearm, right? They, uh, yeah. They're, they're in a, if, if, yeah, you gotta you know, be if, able to if I could, if I could be telling you, Hey, this is, this is what you should be doing. hundred percent. You should be carrying a firearm. Like that is, that is absolutely that's that's an easier tool to use than a blade is. Um, so to me, the way I look at it is they're they're complementary. Right. Um, then the next thing you said was it's horrifying with the blade, and just to speak to that, I've never had anyone start crying when they shot a pistol. I have had some pe- or some some ladies start crying when as soon as we start doing blade stuff. Really? Because it's you know because we're taking aluminum training blades and mm-hmm. I'm teaching them okay you're going to take this here and you're going to put it right there and and you're going to try to thrust the blade in right here and you're going to rock it like this to ensure that you that you actually access the targets that you Ooh. want to and you know when, when we talk about what you know, one one tool you can use at distance and it's kind of, it's cleaner the other one is much more it's, yeah. it's going to be messier and it's going to be up close um, and there is there's there's a little bit more of kind of that raw instinctual it's, yeah it's definitely you know, more primal i mean the yeah. blade it has to be the small part of the brain that's why like you see a knife and you're afraid like, I, I don't know. I see a gun and it's like, oh my God, I shoot tons of animals. Like, I never want to be shot. Yeah, I definitely don't want somebody taking a machete or a sword right. or a big knife to me. Like, that seems way more horrifying. And I don't know why. I mean, I guess it's got to be like the small part of your brain. Like, it is. It, it, it's terrifying. Well, to me, like, I feel there's like this subconscious feeling that when you, if someone is about to commit something, whether it's a crime or an act, whatever, and all they brought, like, at least in in the modern time where, and especially up here where a lot of people have guns, if someone's about to do this and they have a knife, I feel like they're just, their their intent is way more solidified. Like, th- part of me feels like, oh, they probably know what they're doing. Like, if I see someone pull a knife when you could have a gun, I'm like, ah, uh, what's well, I mean, going it's on? It's just the whole, the whole concept, because you got to be able to touch someone to right. use a knife on them. Yeah. But I mean, that's where a lot of our violence happens. Yeah. Is, I mean, I, you yeah. Know, I think is, we talked about it earlier. It, it's like, yeah, most. Most encounters, I don't know the number of, of like, let's say, civilian shootings and in, in, let's say the defensive ones because offensive, like w- whatever, but defensive shootings. Most of it probably starts with a physical confrontation. I have no mm-hmm. idea, but I would bet that it's a large percentage. Like it has to be close. Well, so, so I would always, so the, the, the goal is you know, using your awareness, being able to see something developing, and then ideally you can, you can, 
disengage or de-escalate yeah. before it goes to before it goes to guns. Yeah, if you can get away, it's great. But that doesn't like that. That's that's actually already a win for you if if you can't if you do see it developing like that and you do have time and space to deploy a firearm. But a lot of times it starts with you get punched in the face and then you get punched in the face again. And then you're like, why is why is there this warm? liquid stuff on me. Oh, actually, whoa, that guy's got a blade in his hand. I'm actually getting stabbed right now. Mm -hmm. And so if, if your system hasn't included, you know, being able to draw with one hand, because maybe I'm, I'm trying to save my own life with my other yeah. hand, right? So being able to pull the pistol out, being able to fire from a weapons retention position, being able to clear malfunctions one handed, being able to go, what if my gun says no, I've still got this great club in my hand, right? You can yeah. smash people with it. You can, you know, you can do all sorts of I stuff. Yeah, um, I think that's an interesting point, too. I think that it's oftentimes um, people who are the victim uh, of some sort of, you know, mugging or whatever happens, and there's a knife involved, don't realize they're being stabbed until they see it. Yeah, um, yeah it's just pain. I mean, I, I know the same thing with being shot. You know, uh, s several people that I know that have been, you know, shot didn't realize they were shot at the time it happened. You know, like a, a friend of mine is kind of, he's shot through the love handle. And he didn't know. He thought he snagged himself going around the edge of a counter. And it just like scratched him or whatever. And he didn't know till after the whole thing was done. It was a robbery. And uh, that he had been shot. Wow. Like he knew they were shooting, but... You know, like, what did he know? In his mind, it was like well, in the normality movies bias or something. And you've never, it's something you've never experienced before. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why we always say in, in, in training, good guys never die in training. Because when you train yourself, and you, this is documented, there have been guys that, you know, in, in departments where they did some sort of force on force and, you know, they, they got clipped with, with, with a training round and then they fall over. Oh, you got me. You know, I'm trying to play this true. Yeah. And guys that do that will fall over for real when they're shot, when it's something that is like completely should not be stopping them at all. You know, so it, it's yeah. one of those, the, the way I always approach is I say, I don't care if that paint round hits you right in between the goggles, your mindset should be, I've got a pretty hard head and that just must have been a light load on that round. I'm going to, I'm going to Charlie Mike, right? I'm I mean, gonna it, continue it, it mission. could deflect. It I could. Mean, that's it the happens. thing. Like stranger things there, have happened. There's stories. So continue fighting until, until you go on. Yeah. I mean, I, I would think in those situations, I don't know. Maybe it's just like growing up watching Freddy Krueger and Friday, the 13th movie. It's like until they like stop moving, don't stop shooting. Like, I mean, it's, it's the tactic that I take with hunting now, which is different, but similar. You're trying to kill something. But, you know, I've lost one or two animals with not putting another round in them, and they fall down dead, and next thing you know, like not. two minutes later, yeah. they wake up and run off. And you don't get a good blood trail, and they have adrenaline, so they're running like 100 miles an hour. They go miles, you never find them. And I would think the same thing. Uh, from a self-defense perspective, like I love that whole Joe Biden shoot him in the legs thing. It's like they can still kill you, idiot. Like it, even if somebody might die, like uh, five minutes later from blood loss or something, like yeah. they've got five minutes to kill you. It's a fundamental misunderstanding of yeah. of, of why you're even applying violence to begin yeah. with. I mean, the the only reason why you would in a in a personal protection. Uh, circumstance the only reason you're applying violence is because you believe that other person is an imminent threat to you or to your loved ones or to some other random person that you decide that you are going to try and protect yeah. um, so the only reason you are deploying lethal tools is to try and stop that now the, the the difference would be between hunt between hunting and and personal protection is in hunting you are trying to kill the animal in personal protection we're just trying to shoot until the threat is no longer a threat if the threat's no longer a threat and the guy's down and you're and you're on him with your pistol and he's he's down and out, we don't need to continue shooting until you see brains or you know whatever other monikers that, that people will use. You sh but you do legitimately shoot until the threat's no longer a threat. Which means if he still has a gun in his hand and it is still slowly moving towards you, absolutely mm -hmm. you continue shooting because that is still a legitimate threat to you. Yeah, because I even think I guess in my mind, like if he's still moving and there's a gun two feet from him. You know, I mean, I, there's there's all the things like, how do I know he doesn't have another gun on him? And you have to be able to verbalize that. I mean, and that, you know, yeah. that's and that's where it really ultimately, you know, ultimately it's between you and God with, with, with what you're doing. Eventually it will be a, 
between you and uh, a jury of your peers. Yeah, right. Gonna, and you I just need to say, be able to yeah, no, to go. You need to be able to verbalize. Hey, this is why I did this. I did this because. Yo, well, his gun was two feet away from him. Why'd you shoot him again? Well, I saw his hand starting to move the small of his back and I've done, had experience with this before and it is known. I mean, I, I talked to a, a, a cop from the LA area about a year ago. He's like more and more crooks carrying, carrying pistols, well, you know, basically one for each hand or what we used to call the, the New York reload, right? Just dropping one, picking up another one, yeah. right? And so if you can verbalize that, hey, that's the reason I shot him after the pistol was over here is because yeah. I thought he was going for something else. He'd already demonstrated intent. Yeah. By yeah. by shooting at the, me or whatever. It's interesting that how much the world's changed in that regard in twenty years. Because I, I know y- you're religious, and um, you know, and the first thing you said is between you and God. And like for me, I wish that were the case. Like my first concern, like I can deal with that aspect, uh, you know, uh, pretty easily. But I, yeah, I worry about now. I think where a lot of cops and stuff do like a jury of my peers. Yeah. You know, that's that's always my concern. Um, I know I was in a situation 15 years ago where, um, you know, a guy uh, kind of ran me off the road and got out with an axe handle and came around the car. And I had a gun and drew the gun. And for me, it's like, I don't want to shoot you, but, no. like, drop the fucking stick or you're getting lit up, motherfucker. Mm-hmm. And for me, we were about a block from advanced armament. I was going to work and I'm sitting there looking at it. And in my mind, I mean, this is so pathetic, but what I'm thinking is I have so much to lose. I had young kids. I had a business, you know, I had dozens of families that relied on our business and me. And it's like, were you going to take the beating over? Yeah. I mean, it's like what I'm thinking, but I mean, to me at that time, it's like, you got like, if definitely not taking a beating, if the dude's got an ax handle, like, yeah, no, you, like you, you run me off the road, you open the door, you pull that out of your back seat. And like to me, like fuck you, fuck you, that's all fine. Like you want to spit on my car when you drive by because you're a fucking idiot. Like okay, but like you you want to do that? But you know it's so sad to me to think like I have to think of these things. Like this idiot driving like a green Saturn that's twenty years old probably has nothing to lose. Like I got a lot of shit to lose. And yeah. and, and it's yeah. unfortunate. That yeah, that's it it's one of the. Uh, I mean, I just finished five days of training up in Bangor and that was probably the number one thing that came up like as as we talk through mindset issues it's not the morality of 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 shooting someone that that's trying to you know attack yeah, you or your think- family like every, everyone's good with that it's the what's gonna happen if What's yeah, going to happen the after the fact, after the right? Fact. And how do I how do I set myself up for success for that? So it, I mean, it's really it's it's sad, and 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 uh, and so many of our cops are put in in a, in a pretty bad position. Yeah, cops these days. now are put, and and that's sad from a community perspective. Where for we sure. talked about earlier, um, it you, just makes all of us less safe when when now these guys are scared to do their jobs because. Yeah. Because of the, the, the current political environment that we're in. Yeah, I mean, and, and the worst spot to be in probably in that situation is a rich white guy. Or a rich old white guy. <laughs> like, I, yeah, that yeah. sucks. Like, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't, shouldn't be. No. But you shouldn't have I to be, think about it all the time now. You shouldn't have to be worried about defending your own life. Like, property and shit like that. Like, I get it. Yeah, like it's not as big of a deal if you have to worry about some repercussions, but like your life shouldn't have to worry about repercussions for this dude shot at me. So I shot him and now I'm going to jail over it. You're right. It's, it's the most basic thing. But I think as you get older, you think more about like the reality of mortality and stuff. And then you think about like whatever it is, a legacy or not uh, putting your family through stuff or even with a business. Like, you know, I own a company that at this point, like, um, you, you know, as it sprawls, hundreds of families rely on our company. And, you know, as you, you know, for me, my kids are almost all adults now. And you think about these things and how important that is. Like, you know, people need jobs to feed their kids and do these things. And, you know, my actions have repercussions. And I mean, I deal with it firsthand because I screw up a lot. But so I think, I think something that can help with, with, you know, kind of visualizing and, and, and working through, because really it's a willingness piece, right? What are you willing to do under, under what circumstance? Uh, is just looking at it and going, okay, yes, I have all these people that are dependent on me. Would they be better off with me dead 
or with me having done something that I think is morally right, but maybe a jury of my peers thought that I acted excessively or, or maybe I broke some little rule in, in, in regards to, I mean, there's so many intricate rules mm -hmm. around concealed carry these days. Maybe you broke one of those little rules and you get jammed up a little bit for that. Is your family, is your business, all those things, are they better off with you dead or are they better off with you in jail still being able to mm -hmm. puppet master and well, kind of kind of run the show from that? You know, to get back to what you're doing in your training, maybe that's part of the value of this is, you know, if you're having to make that decision in a split second when you're under, uh, you know, duress and adrenaline, you know, the influence of that, like, yeah, m maybe that is part of the training is you need to be prepared for the mental aspect of being able to make a fast decision. 100%. And you can't, I would argue that you can't make that or uh, let's not use negatives. It is significantly oh. harder to make that decision if under pressure in the, in the heat of things, if you have not thought it through. Yeah, That's so, why so like the willingness is the, the, the most, yeah, well, we, so we call that willingness. What are you willing to do under what circumstances? And then the way we get faster at making those decisions is something that we call pattern recognition. So how does the grandmaster level chess player make a move that is correct to the finish? How does he make that decision in two seconds? Well, he's just, he's yeah. made that decision a million times. Yeah, the repetition. That, it's 30 years in two seconds, right? He's that, that guy is a student of chess. So that he might look at that and go, that was 1994 and 1995, and I played this game from this place from both sides for one hour on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right. Right? So, cause so, he, so he just looks at it and it's like, oh, pattern recognition, bam. So if we are in the context that as I teach, you're a student of violence. And some people will, will take that as a negative thing. I, I don't look at it. It's not negative. Anytime you're learning how to punch, how to do anything, that where there's potential for violence, you are a student of violence. So we should study well, what do bad guys do, okay? What and what are correct responses yeah. to that? And yeah. then if you learn and you can and now, I can put this into giant categories. I can go, oh, this guy's coming right towards me with a giant pipe. I've seen this, you know. I've watched this a hundred times on videos and body cam. I've repped this myself, right. you know, fifty or sixty times. And therefore, in my case, hundreds and hundreds of times now, right? So therefore, I know the correct response is get off the X drill, right? I'm going to sprint laterally to my target. I'm going to draw. I'm going to backplate that guy as he's moving towards me. My lateral movement makes him have to turn, slows his charge down. So I know that's the correct response for that versus, okay, you happen to look over. Now, all of a sudden, a bad guy's pointing a pistol at one of your loved ones. Okay, completely different response. Now, the correct response is pull my pistol out and shoot the guy. There's zero movement required because the weapon is not pointed at me. Yeah, I, I, I think what I took from what you said, too, is interesting. And in, in where you said studying bad guys and from, a, you know, we talked earlier about like community. And, and I know that's important to you with like your religious beliefs and, you know, sense of community and sense of, you know, just protecting liberty and freedom, like a lot of basic American things we don't think about. And I think overall that we should when we talk about like federal government or making laws and, you know, where you and I were talking earlier and it's like, you know, from my perspective, like when an individual needs something and they need help, they should go to their family, they should go to their church, they should go to their community. And then if, if you're beyond that, the question, and, and you want to offer this individual help, is like, if those people aren't helping this person, what's the reason? And should we yeah. do it? And I think that's where, like, the federal government becoming overreaching thinks that now. And that led me to the thought when you said study bad guys. And, like, what we're doing now, I think, is the wrong thing. We're trying to eliminate all bad guys from whatever perspective from history. You know, and, like, I think, like, w whether it's, you know, Hitler or people disagree with the Civil War, all these things. It, it's like you, these things are all important to remember. And, tr and, and instead of trying to erase yeah. them, you know, like uh, Ivanka, who you met earlier. So her she's Polish and her family's German and Russian and and um, she's she's not Jewish. And her some of her family were put in concentration camps like two of her great aunts because they were nurses and they were uh, tending to uh, uh, like a Jewish community that were hiding from the Germans in Poland, like in, in the wilderness and stuff. So it's like a convoluted story. But it's like they were placed 
in concentration camps and, you know, probably going to be gassed or whatever over time. And, you know, it's like us trying to ignore that whole thing by like, let's erase it. No, it should be studied and we should recognize it. And I think that goes to like our government now. Like why does our government continue to want to overreach and influence our daily lives? And as a society, we think um, you need to, we, we need some knee jerk reaction and we need to make laws nonstop and they never go away. And all that does is restrict liberties, yeah. you know, freedoms of individuals. And, and like, I don't need the federal government telling me, what to do and we should remember all these horrific things in history not that like hitler should be celebrated but he should be studied because he was almost successful yeah well when he said when you said study the bad guys i didn't i mean you you looked at it as a bigger picture and like a world view and i think it correlates when you first said it i just thought of like the kind of our environment but like an example is there's some controversy with him here and there, but like Ed Calderon, all the stuff that he's teaching is like, Hey, this is what, this is what bad, we know bad guys are doing. So I'm going to teach you that because like, who's going to be attacking you? It's going to be those course, guys. Yeah. So it's yeah. like the same thing goes with like what you just said with Hitler. You want to study it because when that happened and people always say, well, we need to learn from the history so we don't repeat it. And it's like, we don't have to worry about us repeating it necessarily. That so, that same guy is going to come up again, and we know how we defeated him the first Whoa. time. So let's do I it. Mean, I think it's amazing listening to the people coming from former com block countries, and they're going, "Hey, America! Like this is what's going on right now. We've seen this before. Like this is oh. the direction that we're going Dude, right now." The stories that Ivanka tells me in from Poland because it was the Nazis and it's the Russians. Like they were so abused and fucked over for so long, and they're like the reality of things. And, you know, it's interesting with, with Ivanka being like somewhat liberal and, um, she just a little over a year ago and, um, she had an apartment in Atlanta and was living downtown and would walk to the gym every night and work out. And she's relatively capable of defending herself and especially as a woman. And that's not a dig at women. It's just like, okay, Yep. Women are smaller, weaker than us. It's just biology. And she had a knife and a gun. She knows how to use both of them. And she's walking home on the Beltline, which is this thing they built in Atlanta, you know, to kind of connect the city. And But it was dark, and it had just been raining, so no one's out. And she would walk about a half mile down that to go from her apartment to the gym. And no one was out. And it was like 9 o'clock at night, and she had earbuds in. And my son and I, I had her on speaker, and, and he and I he, he were in the living room watching something, talking to her. She's walking home, and a guy attacks her and tries to rape her and tells her, what Aiden and I hear is, I'm going to rape you. Like, we hear a little bit of a scuffle on her saying something like, what the fuck, or whatever. And then the, we hear a guy say, I'm going to rape you. And, wow. And it was like, and my son looks at me, and I'm like, and at first I thought it was like some stupid friend of hers that thought it would be funny to scare, but it turns mm -hmm. out it's like a dude actually trying to, to rape her. And um, and then we just hear the scuffle, and we hear like a, a lot of striking. And, you know, and my son's like freaking out, and I'm like, you know, and me too, but I'm like, we have to listen for the police report and everything. Like, she's obviously being attacked. And then like... 10 seconds later she's like hey baby <laughs> i'm like what the fuck you okay she's like oh yeah i'm fine and i'm like what just happened she goes oh some idiot just grabbed me and i was like no 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 we heard the whole thing but in her mind so she's got a gun and a knife and fortunately for her this guy didn't like hit her over the back of the head and knock her out and just grabbed her and tried to drag her to the ground and she sent us photos of her clothes all ripped off of her you know like torn to shreds and stuff like that. And, um, you know, she was just fortunate that she was able to like, you know, she soccer kicked the dude in the face and kicked him in the, in the like, but actually got into physical confrontation and was able to yeah, like overwhelm him because he wasn't expecting it. And I'm like, Oh my God. You know? And she's like, you think I should call the police? And like, she didn't even want to cause she didn't want to get the guy in trouble or something. I don't even know what the situation was. So I was like, why didn't you kill the guy? And she's like, well, I don't want to hurt someone. You know, I was like, you have a gun and a knife. And, and um, 
And she's, you know, and that was kind of her mentality. And mine was like, and of course me being a jackass, I'm like, like you're tough and have the capability to defend yourself. But when she describes a guy to me and she describes him to a T and everything, I'm like, you have to call the police right away. And I'm like, where's your gun off? She goes like, they're in my back. And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, the reason you carry the knife is to have it in your (laughs) yoga pants. Yes. And secondly, and I'm like, you know, and this is like the asshole part of me. I'm like, you have an obligation. Like the dude, so she said he was 35 to 40. And I was like, you think he became a rapist tonight? Like yeah. tomorrow night, he's going to be attacking some girl. I should have, I don't, I don't think I should have ever said this to her. I was like, he's going to be attacking some girl that does not have like the constitution to defend herself or the ability and that, you know, and yeah, you know, for, for me, it's like th- th- that was a, a, a something in my personal life where it's somebody that, that I love very much who, you know, probably 99 girls out of 100 ends up dead or raped. Yeah. The and mindset thing seems to be super, I think it gets overlooked, but in the last little bit of time, even this year, we've spoken to a few people and like, like when we were in Virginia Beach, all those guys are drilling mindset, mindset, mindset. And it's cool to to see that it's not getting overlooked as much as it was, but it seems to be the most important thing. 100%. Like, I mean, it's much, much better. Uh, I would rather have a guy who has one move, and that's taking a brick and power slapping with that brick. Right? I'd rather have I'd rather have the guy that has that move and that that's the only move in his arsenal, but his mindset is right. He's thought about when he's willing to go to or, you know, go to guns, but use violence. He's thought about when, under what circumstance, for whom, all those things. I'd much rather have that guy than the guy that's an amazing MMA fighter and carries tools and he's gonna step up and posture, you know, and do all these things that are that will that will get well, you. Well, you do understand I mean, you know, because of, uh, of martial arts, like a big part of that is having the confidence to react or you know, generally react to someone or approach someone with the confidence of, you know, y- you are not going to overwhelm me or, okay, it's a fight. That's For fine. Sure. I mean, one of the um, things, I mean, that, that uh, stops so much, you know, of that, because, you know, the, these punks are people who are willing to do this to people, you know, I mean, of course they want like everything else, the path of ease, you know, least resistance. Yeah. And so if you show like, okay, like, uh, that's fine. We'll see how this turns out. I mean, that ends a lot. I mean, just that confidence, I think, just having the martial arts, a lot of martial arts to where I, you know, like I'm not the best fighter in the world, but like the average guy, if you haven't trained in jujitsu or, or movie, uh, like just any sort to any level, like uh, unless you outweigh me by 50 pounds, you're probably taking an ass whipping. I mean, so one of the ways that we verbalize this, this is something that uh, I took from, from Syak Kali was feeder versus receiver mindset. Right, the feeder is the guy that's controlling the tempo, controlling what is going on. Doesn't necessarily so it doesn't mean that you're sucker punching people first. Yeah. But it does mean that you are maybe you see that guy coming, the feeder engages verbally with this guy. Hey, what's going on, man? Like there's something I can help you with. Why don't you stay stay right there? Hold just give me give me a little space, man. You're kind of creeping me out. Like hold, hold you know, like all those things. That that is a feed that you can do, which also then allows you to gauge what well, why is this guy doing this? Mm-hmm is, uh, you know, it kind of allows you to gauge what is his intent. Well, also the cultural aspect, I think, is kind of what you're talking about. Like, we need to have the the mindset, everyone should have the mindset is, I am not wrong for being suspicious and being willing, the willingness to defend myself. Because my mindset's always like, I, I mean, who wants to hurt someone else? You know, just, yeah. but if... I suspect you're trying to hurt me or someone I care about. Like I would rather, you know, um, act first. Hundred percent. Like I, I, I mean, don't, I don't you need sh- you to wait go for first. you. You yeah. don't have to. I mean, that's why and, it's, and, and it's I not just hostile act; it's hostile intent. There shouldn't if you be. Can verbalize guilt with that. that. Yeah. If you can verbalize, okay, this guy, this guy kept coming towards me. I tried. I said, hey man, you're you're making me really uncomfortable. Why don't you stop right there? Maybe you place an obstacle in between yourself and your potential threat, and now this guy walked all the way around it. Absolutely, go first. Yeah, I mean, I, but I think part of that is like a mindset and a cultural mindset where we see now, you know, it, it's like whether it's race or sex or just, like all these things that are happening, it's like we need to boil it down to like intent and good and bad. It's like I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of that mindset piece. It's getting more and more confusing, though. And like you feel guilty for 
you know, especially like the Me Too movement, we tried real hard to make you feel guilty to be a white man. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's why it's so important. Think, you know, know what your know where your morality is based in, right? Like, make sure that what you think is right is actually right, because that's that's really really important. Um, and then be confident within that. Uh, you know, it's just it's a if if you're not. It, it all goes back to that, that willingness piece, the mindset piece. If you haven't thought the stuff through ahead of time, right? If you've thought it through and you're like, man, this is like, not only is this wrong, but this is like, the, who, who else is this guy going to do this to? If, if, I, if not me, then who? Yeah. Right? If this guy's, this guy's jumping in, he's, he's attacking me. Like, it, it's a, in some regards, you should be outraged. Who does this guy think he is? Like, this is, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm an American and, and I'm here in my part of, of of america and I'm, I'm doing my thing and i'm being a productive member of society and you're going to come in and try and rob me or hurt me or hurt someone in my family or someone yeah. in my community I'm like no like we don't that that's not okay no i agree it's a, it's a sad state of affairs jay let's uh let's shift gears i got some gear questions I, that's where they said gears Whoa. no but <laughs> i have some gear questions Sad i'm a gear nerd so um there's a very popular so like Kevin will talk about it, I'm a clone nerd. Um, there's a very popular kind of community with an account. There's a an Instagram account uh, at Clone Rifles, um, and they have a website, whatever, and they just kind of lay out specs for different clones that people want to build. And there is a very popular photo for the NSW Recce rifles, uh, and it's you in a helicopter. <laughs> um, so. I just was kind of curious because there's not a lot of talk about that setup in general. Um, I think it was a 14.5 with a either 14.5 or 12.5 with a variable powered optic on it. Um, is that something? I don't know if you were. I know now you're into you're a gear guy, but at the time, um, were you very gear focused or? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, you're, you know, as a, I mean, the guys get into what you know what they're carrying you know a little bit more a little bit less um that was a 16 inch gun okay um it was it was 16 inch gun that our gunsmiths had had built for us had a you know knight's quad rail on the thing um a geisley trigger in it uh it was actually a recessed uh i think it's op sync yeah yeah can so it was a recessed can that's probably why you thought it was a a, right shorter yeah five or or 12 five because it you know probably yeah, that much of the can yeah, four, is, is actually there was a there was a sleeve that the guys had built for us to uh put the thing on uh and i believe that was wearing a night force two and f to 10 with probably with a t1 mounted on top of it because yep. that, that was kind of how we were rolling yeah. actually every one of my rifles didn't didn't really matter what what the you know whether, whether it was a 10 and a half inch gun or a 16 inch gun i set them all up the same way with really? those yeah the two those night force two and a half tens and yeah and T ones on top. Actually, we started off with J points on top, mm-hmm. and then had the doctor sights on top, and then those none of those were were surviving. And then right. uh, and then we we started putting T ones on top of there, and yeah. you know, that's obviously a really good optic. It's cool that you bring that up. Um, when we were in Virginia Beach, we did a podcast with the the GBRS guys, um, and one of the talking points was that there were times. Well, there was a a whole deployment that one of them never put an opt. I mean, it was hoofing around an mp7 but he never put an optic on it he had uh iron sights and then there was a talking point where guys like at night weren't even turning on uh their eotech or, or whatever it was just because of the the proximity that they were using it but it's cool to hear that well he used a laser on the mp7 right right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah under nods um so but it's cool to hear that regardless of what you you kind of were doing you were setting it up the same way as far as with an optic and a variable powered optic as well i um, mean because you could you could shoot Bar with it. I mean, I was a, right. I was a recce guy for a long time, so it's like I, I you know, kind of had, had the wheels, had the, had the right. software, so to speak, to shoot out the distance. Yep. And then, you know, with with all of them being set up the same way, that you're know, run, running the, the chin weld yep. for that, you know, that that kind of high high offset what wasn't an issue for me. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I always, I mean, we went through a phase where guys weren't weren't put were not putting lights yeah. on their guns at all because they're like, oh, I'm doing everything on nods. And, you know, the only thing I'm going to do white light is, is just a, you know, a, a quick search after the target's secure. And I can just do that on my helmet right. or, or handheld flashlight or whatever. I always thought, you know, 
guys will disagree on, on certain things. I, I was one of those that I, I always had a light. I didn't now I didn't have a crazy like thousand lumen light. Oh, I didn't have thousand lumen lights right. back then. Um, but you know, I always had just had a single, single cell flashlight on there because I, I i do think it's a good idea to do that same i mean like pistol pistol use was the same thing yeah like we went through a, a huge phase where guys were like why am i even why am i even carrying a pistol and, and doing all this pistol training when we're not pulling pistols out um and so a lot of guys for for years didn't carry pistols i right. always thought it was a bad idea and especially as a wrecking oh, really? guy like yeah. climb, climbing up on roofs and stuff like that i like to have the ability yeah to if i were doing that out. the pistol's good but I, I mean i think for i don't know even standard infantry it's like a pistol doesn't seem no but for, for the majority of guys plus you know shooting a rifle is so much easier than shooting a pistol oh, so if you're yeah. going especially if you're talking non non-soft guys that don't get enough training mm-hmm. on any of their platforms now to, to, to take a guy and get him proficient with a pistol is going to be super hard. Yeah. I mean, it was hard enough getting our own guys to, to run, you know, pistols at a, at a really yeah. high standard. Well, it's, it's well, yeah, I mean, it is hard. I mean, I know if you're not shooting tens of thousands of rounds a year through a pistol, it's hard to be good with one. It is. Yeah. And like, you're not going to take five years off golf and be good at it. I don't know about golf. I <laughs> you're not, not going to do it with a pistol. That's for sure. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's sort of the same thing, a skill. Yeah. Oh, like shooting sure. a rifle is, not difficult. No. Um, shooting a pistol is extremely difficult. I bet Mike Day was happy that he had a pistol with him on that one day. Hundred percent. When he burned these. those guys down yeah. with his say yeah. for he sure. He, I think he caught rounds through the through the uh, really? the grip. I think that's what he said. He said he felt it like in his hand crumbling. Um, but yeah, he had the two two six with him. Yeah, pretty well, cool. Well, okay, I want to ask some questions about that. So you 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 decide you decide you want to go in the military and you want to be in a, a, a organization that is difficult to be a part of and is most likely to see action if there is war. Yes. That's correct? Absolutely. So does um, so it wasn't you were necessarily biased to Navy SEALs, just like you grew up, heard about not, it, wanted to be a Navy SEAL? Not at SEAL. all. No, it was, it was one of those I – and I – I've wanted to be in the military or had wanted to be in the military since the time I was five or six years old and at a very, yeah, I mean, why? that's how God made me honestly. Like there's no, you know, pe- people have different, it wasn't a movie, an uncle, no. uh, you see in like people have different bents in life. Like you're designed to run businesses and like, like see things and problem solve and stuff like that. Like this was one of the things is just, man, just, God put that in my heart to okay. like, that's just part of who I am. So yeah. was from an early age, wanted to do that. Uh, my dad was like, well, if you want to you know, be in the military professionally, you should go to West Point. So for a long time, I was like, yeah, okay, that, that's the goal. I need to go advice. to service that again. set you up for life probably. Yeah. yeah. So that was my goal. It was to go to West Point up until about my junior year, which was about the time that <laughs> puberty uh, kicks in. And yeah, we we'd moved back from Africa the year before. So my sophomore year, I was I was still pretty studious, and then my junior year, I started wrestling, started partying a little bit, and uh, and just had zero desire to study or you know to apply myself to yeah, academics. Yeah, you can't do that all. and get into West Point. And yeah, and so by by the time I was partway through my senior year, I'm like, well, that's not happening at all. Uh, but I still want to go in the military. So then I just start. I started reading about force recon and special forces. And, you know, and so so, and so there was stuff. something that you, you you wanted to be special forces. Absolutely, yeah. That was you know the the goal was to do something along those lines. Uh, and then I just you know I kept reading as much as I possibly could on, on all the different topics and came to the conclusion. I think that the SEAL teams look like the hardest organization to get into with the highest likelihood of seeing action. Oh, that's Mm -hmm. pretty cool. And I think, you know, the, I didn't always think that I made the right choice, but uh, I mean, there was, you know, there was ups ups and downs in in careers, but uh, as a whole kind of looking back on it, I, I think I made the right choice. I think I would feel that way every second I was just in the water. I'd be like, man, I could have been a, I could have been a combat me, controller. Or a me being tech a P. combat controller swim. I could have been pirate a pirate in a guy. different life. I would love the water aspect of this. Yeah, that's right. And probably pirate till guy. I was they were drowning me, and then I would hate it. Till it's cold water. Are there oh, any? Are there? It's terrible. I know. I don't, the hot tub wouldn't heat up fully the other day. Like we were running out of gas, and it was like I don't know eighty something. And I go down there, and 
put my foot in there. I was like, fuck this. I'm not getting in there. I'm so soft. Are there any seals that actually like the water at this point? I think they're out there yeah. because I do see some guys that like, the, the, you know, I've got friends that are still like, they love surfing, you know, guys that love surfing the way I like skiing. So there, there are some guys that, yeah. that are, that are like that. Um, I've, I've got a buddy that lives on a boat down in the keys somewhere. And I mean, it's know, probably guys that grow up on the water or something yeah. though. That's gotta be yeah. something that is, is from the time you're, you're, you're young for I, me now diving when guys are like, Oh, you still like diving? I'm like, well, here are the, the three conditions for me to go diving world-class location, like 100-plus foot viz, 85-degree-ish water, and free. Yeah. If it meets all of those, I'm in. If it's yeah, any anything yeah. outside of that, eh, I'll no, pass. It is one of those things, like when you bring up like temperature, mm-hmm. yeah, the, the water is It's one of those things where a few degrees is like it's a world of difference. Well, not even sure. that, but the smallest thing goes wrong, and your day is bombed out like there's the story of Ephraim Matos or whatever like or anything his, else. the last dive that he did I think there was bad air in his tank or it wasn't purged all the way so there was mixed air he passed out underwater like shit his wetsuit and he's I'm, I'm not diving anymore like little things that you don't think about can ruin your day yeah that's the last place I want my day I mean, ruined, I think is attention water. to detail yeah. it's important it's, it's the same thing with helicopters or anything else like no, most of the time it's, it's great but one thing goes yeah, really my, that's rotary blood. now is in your blood I'm gonna yeah you know what we got another drone so it's in my blood you know why we had to get an extra I don't I, th- I, I think you epitomized the reason we had to get an extra no one. that's not true I know why we needed an extra one but I had nothing to do with a dog attacking our drone Gorilla glue in five minutes fix that one. So what ha- what happened to it? why it was out of commission for like ten percent of the year because of you. wrong. It was out of commission for like a week and a half. That won't, is absolutely untrue, N- Thomas. How long did we not have the drone? No, you're not. No, you don't have to because I sent it to DJI. Shout out to my sponsor DJI, uh, and they fixed it in like a week. They sponsored me. We did not have drone footage for over a month. Well, uh, that's because we had no opportunities to use it. Yeah, I agree. We did not have opportunity to use it. We just also weren't really doing. It. We can't fly it at the shop. First of all, we have to like go to a location because we're too close to peas. It's not as easy. It's not like an everyday thing for us. It can be now that we got this new one. You're gonna see the greatest footage you've ever seen in your life. From yeah, me. you you climb in a tree to fetch the drone. I can't wait to see that. I'm gonna footage. save you with a drone. Save me with the drone. Yeah, someone's gonna be chasing you. I'm gonna buzz it. I'll give you Kaz with a drone. I, we'll see. We'll see. I know how this plays out. So, well, um, okay. What are my other questions as far as the Navy goes? Let me ask you this: Does everyone on a SEAL team want to be in Dev Group? No. Really? No. Nope. Uh, yeah, I think it's, I always thought it was crazy that that, that, that is the answer, but no is, is the answer. Why is that? Some guys just, I mean, guys, guys will give different reasons. For well, What's your reason? Well, I wanted to. But why do you think some guys don't? Or why were you driven to? Well, I mean, some guys have family stuff going on, right? To, to me, that, that would be a very legitimate uh, if you're you're already you know you have a young family coming in, it's hard it's 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 hard enough being in the service and then especially being a, a SEAL team and then having a family. And if you go to the command, you're going to go through the whole new guy process all over again. Um, so, it, which means you need to spend more time at work and you're expected to go on all the trips and all that stuff. So, you you are going to spend significantly more time away from your family. So, I think that oh. that would be a pretty legitimate reason. Okay. I mean, for some guys, just the for some guys, it just never works out. Like they maybe they wanted to, but then they ended up they weren't super aggressive in, in going after it, and then they get orders someplace else, and then you know life circumstances change. And I mean, there's there's really a for most guys, it's a fairly small window of where they're they're truly at their peak and they're able to to go in and and, and really perform hard. Um, some guys might just not have. I mean, it is reputation based. So some guys might just get the thumbs down, like, you know, no, no, thanks. You know, th- thank you for your application, but, but no. Um, but does everyone on like, um, you, you know, Whiteside, do they have the opportunity to try out? 
in theory, yes. Yeah. At so at the level, like in the teams, are there dudes that are just kind of biding their time? Like on the I was a pogue. There are plenty of dudes that they signed up and they're just there for whatever their ulterior motive is, whether it's schooling, whether it's whatever. They just are there. But you expect that to see that at that level. At that in the soft community, are there dudes that are just yes, but a lot less. Yeah. Way less. I mean, they're still like, they're still good guys. They still are. Most of them are still good guys. Uh, they still have a high level of motivation. They still have, you know, obviously physicality, a, a bunch of skill. They were able to, able to make it through, but then maybe their, I mean, maybe their motivation was, I mean, uh, this is unfortunate side effect of, uh, you know, kind of everyone knowing about the SEAL teams. Now there's, it, it's kind of a, it's a popular thing now. So some people just want to do it just to kind of check the box. Can I, right. am I, am I good enough to do this? And so as like, as I talk and I do talk to a fair amount of guys that, that want to go in the teams, my question is always, Hey, why, why do you want to do this? Oh, I just want to test myself. And yeah, you know, there's a lot of way go, go hike the Appalachian trail. Like yeah. that will test you go, or go to the continental divide. That'll test you even more right there. There's a lot of different ways to test yourself. Like that's not really the answer I'm looking for. I'm not going to say the answer I'm looking for on here because of course people shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you need to come to that conclusion, yeah. but we'll I mean, there's a, uh, you should have, you know, it, it should be more so than just testing, right? It should be about, Hey, I want to go get after it. I want to go do this job. And you know, that's, that's important. Right. Hmm. What chapter in your book is that going to be? <laughs> if I write a book, <laughs> it'll be about raising children. Oh, uh, you have seven kids, seven What's wrong with you. You can't even count that high. <laughs> Uh, well, what um, so the majority of your time in the Navy was was in Dev Group. Yes, all ba- that's interesting. You were at the command for like, or the whole time the GWAT was going on, you were at the command, correct? Yeah, I was sitting on the quarter deck on nine eleven. Man, what an interesting time in history. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, guess. I feel very very privileged to have time. been there during that time yeah, and just to kind of see the timing's right, the evolution of it all and. I was just definitely uh, be able to work with you know some of the most capable men on the planet. No and shit, super, yeah. super privileged to be able to do that. Yeah, you guys got a lot to, of shit done to be able to be a part of that. Yeah, it was interesting too. And I mean, then it, and I don't know all the, the the takes on it, but it it is interesting. Like during your tenure, like a switch, and you got an admiral in charge of SOCOM, and like I don't know all the things that you know, dictate who gets what missions, but then it does seem to relate to if you got a general or an admiral in charge of SOCOM and like I'm sure that has nothing to do with <laughs> yeah, that, I'm right? sure <laughs> not. But you know, you you guys starting to get a lot of the good calls and, and whether it's like they want to claim it's territory or, or, or whatever it is, if it's there was definitely a massive shift um, you know, while I was there between us not getting the good work at all to, to us getting a lot of the good work. And yeah, I mean, uh, also fortunate if that's the stuff you want to be doing. What what for was sure. what were what was the best part of deployment for you during that that tenure? Hey, it's, it's hard to say. Like, a, a, you know, any specific thing. Like, I always liked the you know post mission sunlight's coming up as you're as you're flying a helo back and you're seeing the mountains and just kind of like it's like little moments like that or, or times as you're walking in and you know and you're. You're, you're stopped for a second and you're in some position like overlooking, you know, you, you got a good terrain feature or I don't, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to say one thing. I mean, there's so many times where you know, kind of, I'll look back on now and just be like, wow, man, that was such a cool, like, uh, you know, whether it was, you know, after the fact we, we crashed the helo up in the mountains and you know, every, everyone walked away from it. And, uh, yeah. you know, 36 hours later, we picked that bird up and flew out with it. Uh, was, was was pretty cool. Yeah, the thirty six hours of hanging out in, in the mountains wasn't so cool. Uh, the, uh, the you know well, you don't get those highs without the lows. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's the way life you works. Know? So it, was it is interesting. It's cool. I mean, to me, I, I I don't know that we've had too many guests from you know your organization or others like you that would have the first thing I would have said was like the mountain view and like no. sunrise and coming like, back. The boys. <laughs> I 
I mean, there's all the things, and I don't think there's any wrong answer, but I think as I get older, you know, and relating to things, like when I spend a, a lot of time in Africa now hunting, and the cool things, I mean, it's like, uh, you, you know, Thomas went with me this last time to document a lot of it, and I know when Thomas was the most grateful or sentimental or talkative or any of the stuff was like when we're having a sundowner, yeah. you know, like when we've had a full day of hunting, and there's like, great success or huge failure and disappointment or whatever the things are that come along with those things. End of the day, we're on top of a mountain every time no. overlooking one of the most beautiful places in the world, the Eastern Cape, Eastern Cape of South Africa. And we're on top of the mountain, like having a bourbon fucking off, looking over something that looks like the Grand Canyon and a jungle combined. It's like, how lucky are we? So amazing. Yeah. yeah I mean, those are, those are some of the coolest experiences. Yeah. I, mean, I remember doing, uh, I mean, this wasn't on, on deployment. This was, uh, I think, going through a tandem course. Uh, I had, a, it was a sunrise jump and, you know, over, over the desert. And the guy that was videoing me came in and took grips with me. It was just like this, you know, like rugged, mountainous, you know, desert landscape. And the sun's just coming up over. And, like, he sees that I'm flying, you know, jumping my guy well enough to where like he he flies in and like takes grips with me i'm like it was just such a cool yeah cool experience yeah. i have a question about that that's semi-related uh did you Jay wants to jump but want tan did you jump a bundle yeah. like in training yeah. walk that like that couldn't have been fun it's very exciting uh, 500 it pounds was not your legs, uh, as we got better canopies so initially we had uh What's just, that mean, a bundle? Like, it's, it's a giant, like a six or eight foot concrete tube, two foot concrete tube that's like, filled with like 600 pounds of stuff. And you they push and it you out and push you go it with out it? Front, it's tethered to you. Why? To get it's more a, gear in. Yeah, it's a... Oh, so you're, 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 you're like the this human, is like you're that. the human piloting a bunch of gear in. Uh, you know, that Sounds you can jump awesome. In. So but I mean... You, you're throwing five, six hundred pounds out. It's pulling you down anyway, and then you're gonna pull the chute. It's gonna keep going, and you're gonna stop oh, yeah. for a the second. The first, so the first one, you know, that what they tell you to do is is come in. You you like you cross your legs. You bring everything in like this because the the openings are really violent. Before we got the zero porosity canopies, and uh, the first one I do, I you know I I you know, you've already got your drogue chute out. I, I release the drogue chute, so you know it's supposed to like slowly start to inflate so you know to, to come out so I, I i release the drogue and then i start to come in to, to cross my arms and instantly i'm spread eagle mm. because the canopy opened really really fast and then i had line twists and it was spinning me so that's why hence the the, the spread eagle effect yeah. and uh centrifugal force is the thing i got down yeah we we're talking about the the the, bar the twist rates right yeah. <laughs> uh, on the barrels so i got down and my camera guy had already shown it to all the guys, and he's like, "Dude, I can't believe you're walking right now. That was the hardest opening I've ever seen." <laughs> yeah. I'm all set. Isn't it amazing though when someone doesn't tell you that it should be scary or hard? Like you're preparing in your own mind for the thing, and then it's like, I mean, we talked about it earlier. It, 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 it's like how tough people are or can be, and how soft we become over time. And the things that you can go through, but yeah, if somebody doesn't tell you it's supposed to wreck you, like yeah, well, they like told me it was going to be it was going to be you know a hard opening. Yeah, just, so you're prepared for it. It was an extra hard opening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're not telling you it should break your back, which I'm sure happens. Dude's blowing hips out. And, oh yeah, guys get so mangled jumping yeah. bundles. It's uh, it's you know it's game on every time you do it. But I mean that's part of the reason why guys like to do it is because it is like man, there's there's not a you know. Eventually, skydiving can become, you know, fairly routine to the point mm -hmm. where you're like, okay, all right, let's go. You yeah. know, um, you're doing it four, six, eight times in a day. Like it's, it, it does come right. somewhat routine. Yeah. There's no routine bundle jump. Like, I mean, I mean, I think it's <laughs> in, in every part of life. There's some of that, you know, like the SAS motto, you know, he who dares wins. Yeah. And it, it's like, I mean, there is something attractive about it, whether it's like, you know, some insanely hot hoochie that, you know, is going to wreck your life and break your heart or 
something, you know, mo- riding motorcycles, you might die jumping out of an airplane with a bunch of concrete <laughs> shit strapped to you. I don't That seems <laughs> crazy. But, you know, being in gunfights, like any of the other things, it's like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's probably, you know, over time, it is very interesting that more boys are born than girls every year, but the population of women is always higher because the death rate <laughs> per yeah. men is higher yeah. at yeah. every fucking age because we're idiots and want to do these things that risk taking. Yeah. Risk. But I mean, life is, this might is, kill us. There's like how sad to go through life and never, you know, always play it so safe that you're like, you, you never ever put yourself even slightly. You know, I mean, it, the thing is it's calculated yeah. risk. It's learning how to manage risk and, and being smart about it. And that's really where, uh, it's just interesting, to, you know, thinking about it in terms of, of, of with children, you know, it's not, you don't bubble wrap your kids. You, you, you take your kids and you teach them stuff. Some and parents then, do, and then, but it, yeah, but it's the wrong. thing is at a certain point, the kid's going to go, okay, now I'm actually, oh, I've, I'm in a car for the first time and I'm a six pack into it and going 120 miles an hour is really fun, right? That's not where you, that's not where you should be learning to take risks. Yeah. Right. Because that's going to get you killed. Right. Risk taking is at, at a young age, you start climbing trees. And when you're really small, you climb a, a five foot tree or an eight foot tree. And you're like, oh, man, I'm really high up there. But mm. really the con for and for them, it seems like you know, you're climbing the, the Grand Canyon. But if they fall out of that five or eight foot tree, it's probably n- n- a very low consequence. So it's 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 learning, you know, just one little step at a time to take risk and then to do risk management. And then, and then by the time that you're pushing the bundle out, well, you've already got a bunch of skydives right. and you have the experience in the air and, and it's, it's no longer a, you're completely overwhelmed by the situation. Yeah. yeah it is an interesting part of life, like uh, risk and how everyone's tolerance for it is different. You know, and it probably goes back to your training and, and, and what you do now in life and teaching people now since you retired seven years ago on you know, self-defense and all that. Because, I mean, there's there's a lot of easy ways to have self-defense. Like, you could not leave the house. You can live in, you know, different area, all these things. But, like, trying to mitigate all those risks. In business, I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's not too different. Like, once I became aware that I wasn't going to starve to death, you know, and part of that probably comes, and you're probably more aware than most people. And I, I think when I was younger, college age and stuff I lived abroad and traveled a lot but you being a kid and you go from America to Germany to Africa and you know the majority of people have not been to Africa and you can go on a safari a rich white person safari in Africa and you will be exposed to just a different level of life and risk and you know or if you go live in Alaska for a couple years like life changes like your number one thing is not to die if you live in Alaska I mean it still is after all this time and you know it's like what risk are you willing to accept and for me like once I realized the point of that was I'm not going to ever starve to death like not here in America it's just impossible like we have it so good and so easy and, and and so for me I think you know part of this is your background environment obviously and me growing up poor and then we were relatively middle class and the things that my parents did to sacrifice for me to have opportunity in me like 100% not wanting their lives but from where they came from in their life they're much harder people than me and they had a much more difficult life and then my primary goal was not to work in a factory and then you know now like I'm building a home in Africa and I spend a lot of time there and for most of them it is like they want a job to where they don't have to spend the majority of their day scrounging or hunting for food. Like, that's still a thing, and I think people don't realize it. Like, so many countries in the world, the government does not take care of you if you are unwilling to take care of yourself. Most places in the world. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. which I mean, is kind of the way it should be. Speaking about Africa specifically, in Africa, if you're, you're a little plump, you got a, a few extra pounds, <laughs> like, that's a sign of wealth. Like yeah. they, they like that because that's, that means you have for enough men. food. Yeah. For, for the guys. It is weird how there's a lot of women in Southern Africa that are large. It's like, like your husband weighs 110 pounds. How, how do you weigh 200? Like, that's the thing that I'm realizing now that's weird, but sorry, go ahead. But 
I just th- I think it's interesting. You know, we're we're one of the few countries where our poor people are morbidly obese and have air conditioning units yeah. and iPhones and, and as society, and as much food as they can as eat. society, we feel they're entitled to that. And yeah. I'm so sick of that. You know, it's it. I mean, you think about. I mean, you're obviously someone that has a conscience, and, and the job that you know you served in the Navy for, Navy for the majority of your career. It's like there's just collateral damage. There is no way around it. And you guys try to minimize it, and that's why we spend send special operations groups in rather than like dropping bombs constantly. And you know, and, and I mean, the real reason for that has to be that as a country, we have a conscience that we do not want to. We want to try to minimize, you know, the the collateral damage and you know that sort of thing and but how we're so willing to accept all of this in america and like oh everyone has a right to education everyone has a right to food everyone has a right to cable and a cell phone and all this other shit and it's like it's so disgusting and gross it's like we're not doing america anymore and the, the, so the, the conversation that needs to be had is what what do you think the role of the government is it's not to save everyone from themselves. It's not the role. It's not equal it shouldn't outcomes. Be. Equal opportunity, right? Everyone gets a chance, right? The pursuit of happiness, yeah, not the guarantee of happiness. That's a brilliant, yeah. I mean, that's brilliant, like, introspection as far as, yeah, um, the pursuit of happiness is what you're allowed. Yeah. It's what you're guaranteed. And should, we have, and we have should the best. be guaranteed. People don't realize it's- The thing is, we're messing up some of the guarantee, and we're totally messing up what you just said. It's like, oh, well, you you deserve this because they have it. And it's like, well, you know, we have to accept some people get lucky. We have to accept some people get unlucky. And we have to accept that the majority of people that are going to be successful, there's a there's a reason and there's a difference. You know, they sacrificed, they worked harder, yeah. like all these things. And you can get lucky. And and the more we the more we try and guarantee the happiness, the more we take away from the the true pursuit of it. Because ultimately, if you're given stuff, you're you're never really satisfied with it. Yeah. You're always out. You, it becomes an entitlement type thing. And <sighs> and the more the more oh. you're able to give to everyone, well, someone's paying for all that. And generally, it's the people that are actually the the ones that are starting stuff the ones that you know they're running businesses i mean it's even true in this country as much as we don't want to like believe it it's still the 2080 rule 20 percent of the people are paying for 80 percent of the stuff and that's in this country and when you go to other countries like south africa you, you know the difference is probably twice as much and you know i think there's no excuse anymore in this country where everyone doesn't have the equal opportunity and i'm all for it but like I, I know even in my position the sacrifice that's had to take place to enjoy you know like whatever it is a pool in a hot tub or you know me being able to go on hunts or me having things it's like I have sacrificed a ton and a lot of hard work and I've been so lucky and I was fortunate to be born an American and fortunate to have the opportunities that I've had but I've also been willing to sacrifice and take advantage of it and it's not free and, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a difficult thing to see with society now in general, but for you guys, it's, it's, it's like when you're w- after nine eleven, and we are in the situation we're in, whether it's going after bin Laden or going after all the terrorists, like the idea that it takes like what you guys were able to achieve. And, and I don't care if it's the Navy or the army or whoever, like the things that were achieved and, you know, and there was sacrifice. We've lost a lot of people, a lot of guys, a lot of Americans. And that sucks. But, you know, in doing that, that, that was a measure where we're willing to do that to save all this collateral damage and the success that you guys were able to have. Um, you know, and some of that, I mean, it's going to relate to the intelligence, but then when it comes down to it, like the end of the day, we got to send guys in with guns and that's so impressive where, you know, the most visual are, are from just the basic American perspective. I mean, the optics of it, you know, the primary thing would be, you know, 2011 when, when we were able to kill bin Laden and that, you know, that was your organization able to do that. And what it took to get there 
you know, it's it's like we could have very easily six months before that dropped a bunch of bombs over there like we did in World War Two, But we didn't. But the sacrifices that are made and our willingness to, you know, protect collateral damage so we sacrifice American lives. And I'm not sure, like, my agreeance on that. But, you know, it's far less than it would have been 20 years before. And some of that is technology and stuff like that and training that you guys were able to have. And, you know, I mean, I, I think I've only been able to be successful within our industry because I embraced it and I just got lucky, probably like you did, someone who, you know, joined the military voluntarily, wanted to fight, and then we have 9-11 and there's a war yeah. on. And for me, it was to some degree the same way. It's like, oh, well, this is kicking off and there's all this money and there's all this potential and there's all this need for technology. And I'm a company, I'm the leader of a company that's, willing to engage in these things and like you didn't even really recognize it at the time now you know we're 10 years removed and you look at it and it's like kind of cool when you step back with a little bit of perspective a little bit of time in between you're like wow that was it's actually super historic times that we (laughs) got to be a part of and and got to see so much of the development of like current ttps and and just kind of the the direction of of the nation Uh, so pretty cool yeah um I don't know. I always reflect on it. And it depends on who, when we have someone on the podcast and where they're from, if it's industry or military. And it's like when we're looking at, you know, stuff that's on the table, you know, like this is actually um, a dev group silencer from the early 80s all the way through the early 90s. Um, the Navy and your organization in particular was always very progressive with silencers. And this was way ahead of its time. This was a nine millimeter silencer originally. And I, have you ever even shot an HK P9S? No, I know, I know what it is, but ne- never shot one. So at the command before you were there, that was the pistol cause it would operate, you know, uh, like over the beach stuff. So, so in the surf and this was a silencer for it and it was incredible. Um, but the technology that's been developed, uh, you know, whether on, on the rifle in front of you that uh, will pull Delta Point Pro, you know, that stuff only happened because of the war or a lot of the optics, a lot of the ammunition, you know, which uh, we poured huge resources into. And then it helps the commercial market and hunting and everything else over time. But there was probably more optic and ammo development, well, small arms development in that 10 years from 9-11 to 2011 than the 30 years prior. Medical as well. I mean, we were, yeah, so we were just, uh, I was teaching a pistol medical course yesterday and just, you know, we we, we talk about when I, you know, went went through Corman A school in 94, I was taught, okay, this is how you stop a bleed. You try try pressure dressing. If that doesn't work, try band, you know, pack the wound. If that doesn't work, try recumbent position. If that doesn't work, try some pressure points. Um, and then if all that stuff fails, go ahead and put a tourniquet on, yeah, but realize move. that, but he's probably oh, going to lose his leg. Tourniquet? Oh yeah, yeah. So this yeah. is how everyone was taught. Oh, even when I was back, taught. back in the day, it I'm was so ignorant. I you're thought tourniquet lose. was the first thing. No, no, it was taught. No, the last so that's, thing. that's the right thing. Oh, it is. So, oh yeah, yeah. So, so that's that how we were movies. taught was that, Hey, if you, if you put a tourniquet on, realize you're, you're probably condemning the guy to lose the appendage. Right. And so because of that, because no one wants to be a bad corpsman or medic or whatever, they would try all those other steps first. And then if that failed, they'd put a tourniquet on. But that might be five or seven minutes later. And the guy might have already got past that critical blood volume where it doesn't really matter what you do at that point. He's he's going downhill. He's probably going to expire. Um, so the war goes and we start seeing all these different cases. And now... You hear the right thing right away. The, the right thing is if you ever look at, at, at an extremity wound and you're like, wow, that's a lot of blood, immediately put a tourniquet on. Yeah. Because the guy is not, and again, he is not going to lose his appendage because you put the tourniquet on. Yeah, think of how many lives could have been saved that just because of that. Like oh, even yeah. I went through basic training in 2013 and we were, granted the Air Force, but we were taught that tourniquet is the last Last move. Like, for the same still, reason you're going to lose still guys, the There's still guys that are putting that out, unfortunately. There's yeah. still people saying, oh, only a doctor should put a tourniquet on. I didn't know that. I mean, to me, uh, I'm so ignorant to it. It's the way I think about it. And, and we're at a huge advantage of, um, you know, with prosthetics and stuff now. Like the technology of that yeah. stuff is advanced so much the last 20 years. But I just think if you're going to lose your leg or die... Like, fuck you. Lose your leg. It's okay, man. You can still have a great life. Like, you're not losing a whole lot in 2021 by losing a leg. Mm. Like, it's not optimum, 
but but the thing is dying. now they have uh, the, I, I believe the the longest one that that uh that they have on record is 23 hours for a soldier that had a tourniquet on his leg oh, in Afghanistan shit. didn't didn't lose his leg that's um, a long time that's a really really long time you get to all the way around there. the world in 23 uh, hours sometimes you get stuck places <laughs> <laughs> it's true which is probably why he had a tourniquet on for that long yeah. Um, but uh, it just it just goes to show like the advancement. I mean, you know, now they've now they've got this this thing called an Xstat where for so for junctional wounds you can't put a tourniquet on. Yeah. It's, a, it's this giant plunger and you shove it into the hole and you and you depress this thing and it has this uh, uh, it's got clotting agent in these little balls of uh, of gauze and it goes in and it will it will stop the bleed for yeah, you. Yeah, I mean it, it seems like we should wound. have clotting that would you well, know, so that sort of so that was agent. another thing that, that that was developed during the war is, is we had this yeah. stuff called quick clot. Initially, it was you, you had you had your wound, yeah, I'm familiar you, with you, that. You'd rip it open, you'd dump it in. The original stuff was like this powder. sandy powder stuff, yeah. and then guys were having problems with that, like burning people yeah, and debridement problems, and and so now that the same material is actually impregnated in the gauze. So now you're put. Now you're just pack. You're just packing a wound like normal. Oh, okay. And so I mean, so all these advances, you know, whether it's it's firearms, whether it's optics, whether it's ammunition, suppressors, or medical gear, all these advancements have happened just over the last twenty years, or a, a huge uh, amount of them have happened over the last twenty years, specifically because of. Well, that was also the longest continuous war that America has been a part of ever. And those things too that like just like guns those carry over into the commercial market and civilian world Absolutely. like a lot of those medical things have then obviously carried over into the civilian world just like a 300 blackout carried over into the consumer like yeah so a lot of those things the wars eventually it filters economy. down uh, yeah i mean war or space race any of those things yeah. advanced technology for uh, i mean you know and even beyond saying okay we have these groups like the, the navy seals or whoever and like, man, you got to oil that machine, you know? I mean, like you said, it's like the, the decade, decade and a half before you you were in, wasn't a lot going on. Well, Nothing. even, I mean, you were pre-9-11, so, like, you even saw. Yeah, it was very, very, very slow. Yeah. I did two two deployments pre-9-11, and they were both very slow deployments. And we actually did do a little bit of real stuff, but it was, you know, looking, you know, which at the time seemed really cool. And looking back on it, I was like, yeah, we, we don't even count those. Yeah, you go <laughs> you go on two or three hits, and then you do six yeah. a night for years. Yeah, it's a little different. Um, another gear question: What do you uh, what do you carry every day for a gun? I assume you carry the Minuteman blade. So I actually I carry normally I carry a Magnus, okay, and a Northman, okay, kind of the the. So we start off blades wise. We start off with the Northman as a you know as a pocket blade, and then I I like the shape of it. But I like you know I live in the mountains. I spend a lot of time you know running through the mountains. A lot of time it's by myself. Uh, so oh, you guys have cougars there too, not not the over forty kind. Oh yeah, so we've got we've got we have lions and uh, we we have yeah. wolves and coyotes. Yeah, and, oh, and a, a bunch of stuff. I'm not so. afraid of coyotes, but I tell you the wolves and the and the the mountain lion. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm. So I wanted a five inch blade that was similar to to the Northman. You got um, you so got we, one on you. I do. Can, yeah. can so, we can we see so this? We rolled thing? with uh, the Magnus right here. Uh, I like the shape of these, the blade shape. So that's a five inch blade. Oh. Um, most guys, you know, this was uh, this was one of those things that business decision wise, it probably would have been better to do the four inch blade, the, the minute man first, because most guys think that a five inch blade is, is uh, a little over the top for everyday carry. And that's what this is. That's a five inch blade. And that's, that's what I carry every day. This seems correct. To anywhere me. we're legal. I mean, uh, you know what I don't generally like about it is I generally carry folders and you know, you have a five inch blade, then your handle is it's very huge. Long, yeah. I don't like that. Yeah. This though. Oh, seems like that'll get to the heart. I like that. Oh yes, for sure. So we came up with this first, and then yep. uh, really liked that. But but input from guys was some guys wanted a little bit shorter one, so we, we ended up making the Minuteman as well, which yep. is very similar to that, but a four inch blade. Yeah. And then our sheaths, the kind of the the LOT or what we call logical order of thought behind that, we put a ferro rod in there on the side mm. because you should always be able to start a fire. That that's an important thing, might save your life someday. And then we put a little bit of Velcro 
on the back of it, and that is so that uh, you can you can store mm. stuff in here. So you could, what? you know, like guys will do like uh, some guys will put a hundred dollar bill in here or a couple twenties. I put it. This is a little. This is not. We got it's cocaine. White, white powder. <laughs> like, it's. it's I don't uh, think you should show that. It's called wet fire. So the stuff oh. burns really, really hot and well. So mm. you just put a little bit of this. So because it's, it's so fine. To start a just fire, it's, get it yeah. Going. yeah. So having a little bit of tinder on you, or I've got guys that'll put handcuff keys or lockpick set or whatever, kind of like whatever, whatever you're into. Situation. But uh, that's smart. yeah. So that, that that was the idea behind. Yeah. Oh, I, I would have right thought there. that Velcro is just so it felt good on your skin. Yeah, it does have that it. effect as well. It does make it nicer. I like that better than the sweaty Kydex situation. So is that Kydex or is that an injection molded situation? No, it's Kydex. Yeah. A lot of little rivets in that thing strong. Yeah, and we went with the smaller rivets. The uh, Just, you know, so much of industry is they, they put quarter inch rivets in there mm -hmm. and it is a little bit stronger but it also makes for a sheath that is so big and unwieldy like this is super easy i mean i i tuck this in i wear it outside of the pants but underneath my belt and it oh, just it just disappears oh yeah i wear it everywhere so oh yeah i, I thought you were carrying inside but outside no, oh, that's so awesome it just, just gets tucked in right here disappears that, that's pretty awesome you carry the other one on you as well yep jesus so this is primarily tool right here. So uh, same kind of concept, only the, the design for this was that it goes into your pocket. Oh, okay. So so, so you, is that how you carry yours in your pocket, like uh, just a pocket clip, but you yep. just have a, a fixed blade? Yeah. Oh, serrated edge on this. Yep. So I, I prefer the serrated for the tool that's in my pocket because I can abuse that thing and those serrations will just keep cutting. You know, and we live on a farm, so, you know, I'm constantly cutting twine and all, yeah. all sorts of stuff. So I like having the, the you know, the, the serrations in there. And yeah. is, is that the I same? I like serrations because I'm lazy about sharpening them. Exactly, out. yeah. But we sell it now. We had we had guys asking for non-serrated versions. So uh, we, we sell both, both serrated, non-serrated, and then also we're, we're doing uh, sterile versions for the guys that uh, – that prefer not to have any branding on there. Uh, mm -hmm. It was initially, it was kind of a, a mill type thing. You know, oh. guys wanted something that wouldn't say, you know, Amtac blades or Northman or, you know, that says the steel type. And they also have serial numbers on them as well. Uh, Your dime bags. I know it's coming right. out a little bit right there. <laughs> Flipped it the wrong way. So nobody. Ambidextrous. Yeah. I was going <laughs> to say you're amphibious, right? And operationally, I guess the, um, the uh just all the ir stuff is more popular than thermal still do they they both have their their place yeah uh, i always tell guys that your biggest increase in capability comes from your first pbs 14 so for you that first night vision tube yeah um that's helmet mounted is your your biggest increase in capability uh because you can it's on your head and everywhere you look you're seeing the thermals are great. Uh, the kind of the, the pig hunters have really pushed the development of, of the thermal scopes. Now, I mean, you can get, you can get thermal scopes for 2K that are pretty decent. I yeah. mean, they're, they're not the same as the 15K ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for what you're getting, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so I, I like weapons mounted for the thermal and then helmet mounted for the night vision. Yeah. They're doing the overlay now. Um, I don't think it was L3. Whatever company just put it out recently, they you put out. You can get them commercially? Yeah, you can yeah. get them that, that'll overlay onto your PVS 14s. Yeah. Well, Adam's got that Skeeter that um, mm -hmm. has that. It's, it looks like, it almost looks like Edge Detect on That's like a, old, too. The Skeeter's not right. new. Yeah. But yeah, it overlays. You can get Edge Detect on them as well. You can, you can yeah. cycle through the, the, the things. Um, that's pretty I mean, cool. They're like. Uh, the Fleer Breach I paid only like 1800 for, and it's. It's awesome. Yeah, the little handheld one. Mm -hmm. yeah. It looks like the Skeeter size. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Again, they're just pushing the, the the more the stuff develops and the more interest there is. I mean, just like PRS shooting has has hugely affected the ability to have nice, accurate rifles because that you know that that game has really pushed it because so there's so much more uh, you know the the demand is there now for for those rifles. Um, and just the, the with the 
uh, with the thermal scopes and then all the, the hog hunters out there trying to put a dent in those things. Yeah, it's fun you know. too. I mean, it's oh, a yeah. practical use for it. Um, but yeah, that's why I was asking because I use, you know, I hunt a lot and I, I've got, you know, I squared stuff and thermal and I just inevitably use thermal way more now. You know, I usually use a thermal handheld and the last couple of years I've used thermals, you, you know, just mounted to guns and have them set up for hunting already. And especially with pig hunting, once you get used to using a thermal, it's, it, it's like you can differentiate, you know, if you've got a decent thermal, you know, pig from deer or other, oh, sure. you know, yeah. cows, if you're in someone's field or horses or whatever. And, you, you know, like you're not trying to identify, I mean, I guess with IR, because, you know, you can identify so much detail. So you could see weapons or, you know, different things like that. You don't really it have still to depends do that. on the distance and yeah. on the amount of natural illumination or the amount of illumination that you're throwing, yeah. you know, during something. Well, is the gap, so like you said, obviously the going from not being able to see in the dark to having a PBS-14 is a huge leap uh, in capability. And then even going from a, a monocular to a dual tube setup is a pretty significant leap. Um is that leap the same going into quad tubes into the, into the pano or is it not as big it's, of a jump? No, it's, it's definitely not as big of a jump, but it is, I mean, it's amazing, yeah. you know, with, uh, you know, with uncle Sam paying for it, I was, I loved it. I mean, yeah, for, I for mean, years, it's great I to be, be able to see more, not looking through blinders. You know? Yeah. I mean, it, it really, the, the going from dual tubes to quad nods, you know, knocks it from this to this. Yeah, right. I mean, right. Which is your huge. field of view. Yeah. That's cool. I just, yeah yeah I, I have both and learned to use both and it's just from a practical sense like i don't know night vision i know is super cool for guys and you know run it yeah for you and you run like the ir laser and for me like i would just have my thermal handheld i go out with buddies and they have ir i just put my laser on the bottom of my thermal and you know because i can see animals instantly and then just start picking them out to them you know lighting them up where they can see and shoot them but yeah, me and Chad, we go hunting pigs by ourselves. We don't even take night vision. We got thermal and a little, you know, we, we have um, white light that, you know, dim and bright settings and just use thermal and, you know, you, you get close and start shooting. Yeah, well, I mean, especially how camouflaged the pigs are to begin with. Yeah. Um, if, and if they're not moving under night vision, it's it's really hard to see them. Yeah, it's hard but to with, pick with up With a thermal, it's just moving. everything stands out. Yeah. Or if you got me running around the woods in that DNC, that old desert night camo, good wouldn't, luck finding wouldn't me. Wouldn't be able to see you. Good luck finding me. Shoot, you're so hot. Your body would be That's lighting true. up everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, so, yeah, it's not the same crossover because I'm trying to think like night vision, like practically for me doing any kind of hunting. I use it to drive sometimes. That's fun. But. Other than that, you got to put like, a bunch of tape or cardboard over your dash. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We in, it you can turn you. it off in the Land Cruiser. You can turn uh, it off. We were in Texas under nods and calling. We had a a minivan that we acquired, and uh, we were driving to a range, which was pretty far, and Colin couldn't have been driving faster under nods. I mean, it's a wide open dirt road. Like, there's no objects we're going to hit, but. Yeah, I mean, if you got good light and can see with an odd zone, it's yeah. like it's not that different driving during yeah, the day. No, um, running yeah. around is different though. Well, you know, you know, I got a Pinsgauer and um, had it at the. <laughs> That's awesome. The farm. <laughs> I've had it since before the war. I had it since the late nineties, and um, my brother wrecked it. That asshole. He's 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 ruined so many things, but I still have it. Have it at, at Chad's house, mm. and um, but our our farm. I started building the roads, man. I would put people in that thing, you know, and they didn't they didn't know about like nods and stuff and I would put my helmet on PBS fourteen and drive wide open on the roads. Yeah. So the, you know, and they had no idea. They couldn't see. I could see per but th man, that's a lot of fun. It is the same thing in the the Pinsgau or the Land Cruiser. You can turn off all the internal lights. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Fun. I wouldn't want to do that on thermal. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so they each have their place. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's okay. So there's that. What um? So you hunt out in Idaho in different places? Yeah. So uh, what's your, what's your hunting setup if you're going to rifle hunt? What do you, what do you use typically? 
honestly, it, it, it depends. We, we can hunt with 5.56 out there. So I've used rifles that I was uh, carrying for, for races. We did the Sniper Adventure Challenge race a couple of years in a row. So I used, uh, I've used a 260 gas gun that we built for that. I've used uh, an 18 inch, basically hy- hybrid recce rifle. Uh, so a 5.56. Yeah, 5.56 gun. Uh, well, if you're hunting with that, what ammo do you use or what bullet you load? Uh, normally, I use Black Hills ammo with yeah. either 62 grain TSX or 70 grain TSX. Uh, That'll do it. It kills stuff. It, it, I mean, even their 55 grain um, Barnes bullet is nasty. If I'm going out with, uh, if I'm going out for elk, I've got a Win Mag that uh, our friend JC yeah. built for me years ago. So I've shot some stuff with that. that nice. is, uh, that's a great. That's, that's a great rifle. Yeah, we three, did a pronghorn Win Mag is a great cartridge. Yeah. We did a DIY pronghorn hunt in Wyoming oh, a couple, shot a couple of years back, and that was pretty fun. That was kind of whirlwind, like drove, you know, drove the 15 hours to get there, set up wall tents, like hunted a little bit that evening, hunted all day the next day, hunted a little bit the next morning, drove home. So yeah. it, was a, it was a, but everyone everyone ended up, we just had, uh, we had doe tags, and everyone got at least a animal. It was a good good time. Yeah, how far did you shoot? I think 270 was as okay. far as I shot, well, but it's uh, but there's definitely there's opportunity. I'd like to go back and do that because there's opportunity to shoot significantly further. Yeah. Uh, oh, there. yeah. That's I'm, why I'm, I asked. I'm a pronghorn. Like, yeah. No, it pronghorn was a, is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, where they live and the way they're set up is like they're generally out in the middle of plains, away from everything, so they can see everything and the shots can be and far. Keep moving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Speed goat. They're fast too. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Did you eat it? Oh yeah. Do you like it? To me, meat is there's there's a ribeye and there's everything else. Uh, so it's I mean I I kind of stopped expecting game meat to, to taste like a ribeye a long time ago. Yeah. So it's just you know is in fajitas or in like Indian food or stews or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, I think it's great. It's fine. No, no yeah. issues. Nick Schaefer, one of our engineers, he's the, he's the head engineer on the Fix Rifle. He um, is from Kansas, where Giant Whitetail are from. And has shot several. We got one hanging at the office. They he shot in his yard that is unbelievable. It's, it's the one in the conference room. Yeah, like twenty two points, wow. like hundred seventy inch. Like, um, but he worked at Browning for eight years out in Utah, and so he went on a bunch of pronghorn cool. hunts and um, avid hunter. But he's like, I haven't, I haven't been on a pronghorn hunt yet. But he was like, ah, he says, at least out there, they eat so much sage. He's like, they're horrible. They taste gross. I hate it. I've heard guys say that, but I've heard people say that about just about every animal. I mean, I've heard people say that about black bear. I've eaten black bear. It tasted great. We've had, uh, you know, I've hunted a fair amount in Africa. We've we've had friends that are like, oh, we don't ever eat zebra. And then I've had other friends tell me, if you shoot a zebra, bring us the back straps because it's our favorite meat. So it's like, it's one of those and meat's meat and and it's all going to taste a little bit different and uh, i mean shoot i've had giraffe mm-hmm. and that was delicious yeah you know so it really just depends on you know how you're preparing it and you know and don't expect everything to taste like a ribeye yeah did, did you shoot a lot of three and a wind mag when you were in i did yeah, yeah that was kind of our go-to yeah. distance gun this uh, is a mark 13 or we did not do the the designations yeah, like that. It was just, it, it was the wind mag our gunsmiths put them together for us and they worked really, really well. I never really cared about throwing a wind mag. And then recently, well, ever since you guys got back from Africa, I see field ethos posts about, about three and wind mag all the time. And I'm like more intrigued as time goes on. It's and a then great, it's a great, great cartridge. It, it yeah. is a wonderful cartridge. I mean, you know, it's based on the 375 H and H. It's a belted cartridge, and so that whole concept's kind of stupid. But you know, it's like 300 blackout. It's cool. 308 is better if you want to kill stuff. 30 out six, you get a little more. 300 Win Mag is better. And I mean, then 300 Norma. Yeah, yeah. even I mean, a little bit better. It's probably my favorite yeah. cartridge, so actually. Yeah, that's that's but, my newest distance gun. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> awesome. Norma. But you know, uh, you know, you go from there to you go from Win Mag ammo, which costs you a buck fifty, two bucks a shot, to Norma Mag, costs you seven, eight bucks a shot. Yeah. And guns bigger, heavier, and but yeah, it's a laser beam. And like, then the next jump off, you go into the you know the the Shy Tech, the the four four sixteen ones, or, and then it gets even more expensive. Yeah, 
But Win, Win Mag, I think, for a practical cartridge is just so hard. Like, if I could only have one gun for hunting the rest of my life, it would probably be a Win Mag over anything. Just because, well, it'd be 8.6 now, but the way I would say Win Mag is you can get ammo everywhere. Yeah. It's reasonably affordable. There's a huge bullet selection. Um, you can get you, rifles for it as yeah, well. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a, a comp- lot of selection of rifles. Yeah, and there's a lot of compact guns, you know, that are reasonably lightweight and stuff. And there's the XM2010. That's one of the coolest guns, but so cool. also weighs as much as that fridge. Things have changed a lot the last few years. Yeah. But, you know, it was a big improvement like that. Um, that capability for the Army to go from a three hundred eight gun to a, a Win Mag and uh, go to a chassis where they can fold the stock and then they can mount a silencer and they had a full length top rail where they could use inline thermal and night vision to mount stuff to it. I mean, it was it's a, a big jump right there. Yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah. There was a lot of things on that. I mean, you think the M24, which served our country great, you had a fixed 10 power on it for the most part, um, non-folding stock, you know, non-threaded barrel, 308, which great round, but you go shoot some animals with 308, great round, but doesn't hold a candle to 300 wind I mean, mag. You're consistently going to shoot 400 yards further with a wind mag than you would yeah. with, with your 308. So, I mean, just that and your wind calls and, I mean, everything is just high, higher likelihood of success. Yeah. I mean, when we were, um, Remington purchased my old company, and when I was at Remington Defense, and we won the M2010 contract, and so then it was one mag. And I was that got a 20-inch barrel on it or something? I think so. Might even be a little longer. I don't even recall now. Mm. But they wanted some 16-inch guns, and so we started working on it because it went basically from a 1,000-yard gun to an 800-meter killing gun. And at the time, they figured if you're stretching 308, the average guy, 600 meters, but practically was probably four or 500 meters. And like 16 inch 300 wind mag was an 800 meter killing gun. And like that, that's a poke. Like hunting anything, like 800 meters is far. And if you can have a 16 inch gun, you know, that's that, you know, is basically the mega fix that we're doing. It started with wind mag and doing a 16 inch proof research barrel having a lightweight compact gun with a stock folded and you know me hunting in africa a lot i usually use 308 and 65 and now i use 86 i've never even taken a magnum cartridge over there but if i could have a lightweight gun where the stock folded and i could hike with the gun or have it on me in the vehicle i'd take wind mag all day over 65 or 308 you know because like kudu or whatever it is in africa like a lot of big animals that are difficult to kill yes what is your favorite animal to hunt over there i mean i'll I'll go out like deer hunting with the kids uh elk is i still haven't shot an elk yet up up in our area um i had a the most exciting elk hunt of my life was only maybe two years after we got up there I, i think it was the first year i had my local local tag and I was hunting with a buddy and he's a much better hunter than me. He does the, the whole, uh, you know, the cow, cow call routine and he would break branches and like, we'd always separate a little bit when we do this and like, serious. he was very serious about it. So the first couple of times he did it, like it was so good. Like I, you know, I'm looking this way and I'd always kind of look, look over my shoulder because it, it just sounded really, really good. So it's, you know, we've been in the mountains, we've been up above the tree line, then we're back down, we're in, in a deep, uh, uh, old dark timber. So see, that's, you know, the darkest timber in our area is cedar. So then these are some b- pretty big ones. I'm laying next to a log, kind of still as a stone. My buddy's 10 yards away from me, and he's doing his, his cow call routine. And about 15, 20 minutes into this, I catch a little bit of movement out of the, the, the top of my eye and I swing my rifle through and here's a cougar running right towards where my buddy is Yikes. and I swing Ooh. through and I shoot and it, you know, it was, it was about that fast, just swung through shot. Um, you I jump up on top of the log, shuck my rifle, you know, get, get another one in the cat's gone at that point. And, uh, he, he, Ooh. my buddy doesn't know. And I'm like, Hey, that was, a, that was a cat. Um, I definitely hit it. 
uh, and it, it ran off. So we walk over. It was 10 yards away from where I was, and it was 10 yards away from where he was. So we were like, so close. it was basically this little triangle right here. So we start following the, this, you know, the spore of this cat. And my buddy's got this monster hog leg of a pistol out and he, you know, he's the better hunter. So he's like the tracker with, you know, nose to the ground. I'm basically strike ready with my wind mag and I'm looking up at all these monster trees and I'm, I'm thinking about all the, you know, the Peter Hathaway cap stick that I've read, you know, death in the long grass and the leopards bleeding out, like waiting for you in the trees and stuff. So that's kind of my mindset as we're moving through and it's like, you know, we'd see a couple a couple tracks and then no blood, no blood, and then like a big patch of dark red blood. So this continues for like 30, 40 minutes or so, and we come around this alder patch, and my buddy goes, we've got a cat down. I'm like, stand by. I walk up. I center <laughs> yeah. punch the thing yeah, yeah, from about 10, 10 yards. I, I center punch it with a you know, 220 grain. This cat jumps up and runs another 40 yards. <laughs> and then we, so we're both coming down now. We're like pying around this Ooh. corner, and we both brain the thing on the, on on the next one. That's uh, high pucker factor right there. But that was uh, that was the most exciting elk hunt. We never saw a single elk, and uh, we ended up, you know, you know, I we ended up, I'd love to shoot a cat, but I'd prefer to see an elk over that stuff. Yeah, oh, same I'm taking, here. I'm taking your Cape Buffalo 15 out of 10 times over a cat. Every time, yeah. I do not want to see a big cat like I, that. I'm with you. I don't know. I, mean, I want to go shoot a buff. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> been on the list for a long buffalo time. Buffalo <laughs> is cool, and I know that it's scary, but it, it's, again, the little part of my brain. I'm much more afraid of big cats than I am the buffalo. I, I, I mean, it's it's like if I have a gun, I'm not afraid of a lot of things, but, you, you know, then I just have uh, – when the limitation is, like, um, you know, my reaction speed, and when I start doing the math, that compared to like a 200 pound cat, I'm like, mm. well, and they're fast. We're back to <laughs> mindset. A Cape Buffalo will kill things when it's pissed off or if it needs to. A cat is obligated to kill all the time. It's an obligate carnivore and it has knives for hands and teeth and it uh, needs to kill to survive. Very, very scary. Very scary. I don't like it. I don't like it either. Man, I, di- I didn't know that. You shot a it was exciting. I mean, that's that's one in ten thousand right there. Oh yeah. It, yeah. I mean, I'd I'd never even seen a cat before then, and I think I've seen one maybe since then. <laughs> yeah, because you can live a hundred years, you know, a hundred yards from some and never see them. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Cats are so cool. If you didn't get that first shot off, like, is it pretty solid? He was gonna try whack your buddy. Assuming I mean, he, he was, was, so he was running right towards that. I mean, the like when we kind of re- reconstructed it, I was here, my buddy was here, the cat was here. We paced it off. I was ten yards away. I shot the thing. I didn't do mechanical standoff, which is why I didn't kill the thing right away. It was because it was literally I was here, and I just and I had you know I got a five to twenty five vortex yeah. scope on oh, there. Yeah. So all, like all that with, and I had the until. you know I I had the illuminated reticle on fortunately as well. So I swung through and just you know put, put the crosshairs on there and shot. And you know mechanical standoff at 10 yards is going to be about that much or so. And so I was low, so I clipped him like like low in or you know high high in his leg right there. Yeah. Um which is why the the, the we found the tracks the way we found them, which was, you know, move, 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 move. And then he would try and place, uh, place right. weight on there and then fall on it. Well, um, what, okay. Well, one last thing for me though, what about Africa? So you've been to Africa hunting. You showed me the picture from 2000 with the kudu. Yeah, that was 2000. Ooh, where were you? Uh, Zimbabwe? In Zimbabwe. <sighs> yeah. What's your favorite thing to hunt there? Probably kudu. Kudu, love the kudu. Yeah, B- Bushbuck and kudu. What th- those are two of my favorites. What else? Now I'm all into this buffalo thing, but that's expensive. Like you were talking about bushbuck a lot, though. Yeah. Like you seemed stoked on those. Bushbuck is cheap. It's difficult. You know, it's tough to see a bushbuck. Like Jay, they're called bushbuck because they're in the fucking they're small. bush mm-hmm. and Makes they're sense. small. Yeah. So it's it's you often get glimpses of them, and they're difficult to hunt. We lit one up. I was so excited to see one. It was not getting away, and I, I make so many mistakes in life and in hunting. Papa made this one happen. I'm telling you, Jay. What's the one? Uh, John Wick. What's the yeah, one? Yeah, it was. It was. It was pretty good. Like I, I, I gotta admit. Like as much as I fuck up, that that was a legit. What was the one that you guys, uh, when the whole Africa crew were here, I 
think it was Jason that shot it. it was like a water nostril or something. <laughs> what, what was that one? It was like the a, water buck. Oh, it's a water buck. <laughs> <What's> <laughs> Water nostril. Yeah, I, don't, I thought it had like a crazy name. Water buck. That's simple. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't. Are know. Are those uh, cool? Water buck is an awesome animal. It's a cool animal. They're super cool looking. Yeah. yeah, and it's a big. It's a very stout. It's a giant animal that's very tough and durable. Um, and it's just interesting. It's called the water buck. Uh, they reside oftentimes around a lot of water, mm. and um, if you're walking through the bush, you can smell a water buck. If it's been there within a half hour or so, they have, they're very oily and it's a very musk mm. smell. And, um, so you can smell them from pretty far distance and, and, you know, and it's designed that way, I guess. So if they're in the water, they can get out and shake off and they're dry. Oh, yeah. It repels the water. Um, and when you're skinning them out and everything, you can't let like the fur or the hair like touch the meat; it ruins it. Hmm. And um, but they're they're big and beautiful horns, so they're not part of the spiral horn family, but it's a ring horn. I, I don't actually know what they call those, but it's the same horn as like a like lechway. a sable, yeah, yeah, like a Dude, just, sable, just, but it's the opposite way. Yeah, but a lechway and a water buck all have kind of the same horns. Beautiful horns, and that's a that's a cool animal. So they're all in. Southern Africa, at least. I don't know about Central or Northern Africa if they're up there. I don't know. I haven't watered them up there a whole lot. Yeah, well, water buck. Water buck's a cool animal, but I think kudu and bush buck right now are my favorite. So, like, I, I just love the spiral horn. So, you know, bush buck, kudu, um, inyala, black buck. Um, little no, little black buck. That's that's in India or somewhere. Oh, okay. It's not African. And, um, but they also have, uh, well, their horns spiral, but they're also ring. Ring, right, yeah. So it's a, it's a different thing. But Elon is Elon also is really a spiral cool. horn. Yeah. Big cow. Cool animal. And they're pr- as big as they they're are and all, they're elusive. They can jump like crazy, too. Yeah. It's an animal weighs 2,000 pounds, can jump an eight foot fence. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. What but was the one we have the rug at the shop? It looked like when you posted the photo, I think it was like the back half of it, it looked like you shot a horse, but it's got a long, like it was like a almost like a mane, but it has like a long. Yeah, the tail other cool well. one is the nil guy. No, it wasn't a nil guy. It, I think we have the cape at the shop, but it was just like it was weird Could looking. Could be from an oryx. Is it the? I don't know. Did you I'll wanted the harder beast. Hardy yeah, beast yeah. Cool. I, I shot one, the red harder beast this time. They call it the Harley Davidson. It's like the horns go up and then go like straight back. They're so goofy looking. And it's one of the fastest antelope. That and the, its cousin is the. Titsabi, which is not as weird looking, but those are very fast antelope. Um, but I think the spiral horn stuff right now is my favorite. Kudu is just, it's one of those things. The gray ghost. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're and, I mean, so I, I, elusive. I, yeah. And, yeah, they're cool. And I see why it's like African iconic, you know, for Plains game. It, it's, for people who haven't gone, it's one of those things where, like, you're in love every time you see it. Like, let's see Red Heart yeah, the hard to be every day, and 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 they're cool. But and and I shot one. I want to put the skull in my lodge over there, and you know I hadn't shot one on their place, and so what, whatever. So now I'm having to like look for stuff to shoot. But um, you know I don't really care if I ever shoot one again. But the kudu is something every time I'm there I want to shoot. Yeah, and it's not that expensive. You know, another shout out to Crusader Safari. So you can shoot an Eastern Cape one. I think they're like fifteen hundred bucks. And uh, a, a southern grader is um, you shoot up in the Uncamas, so like farther north on the coast. But it was, and maybe they're over two thousand. And they're a little bigger species, but they're just slightly different. But man, kudu is it's just incredible. And yeah. then yeah, I've just fallen in love with bush buck as well. And they're interesting and beautiful and difficult to hunt. And it's a small animal and. To me, it's just the, the the appeal of hunting in Africa is just the amount of game that you see and the variety of game. So it's like you might, yeah. I mean, I've spent, I've spent months in tree stands in Virginia to, to get one shot off with a bow on like a <laughs> tiny little doe. Yeah. Uh, whereas in Africa, if you're, if you're cruising around you know, and you see, see game drop off, spot and stock, you might do that three, four times in a day. Yeah. And that's with hunting with buddies too. So it's, it's not you're not you're not even up every single time. And it's just 
it's just awesome. It's great so, experience. It's so incredible. I mean, and to me, you were, you know, it's all grass is always greener, but I, I'm so envious of you getting to grow up part of your childhood in Africa and how interesting it is. But yeah, for someone who fell in love for hunting here, and I devoted so much time and energy and resource money to growing whitetail at my farm in Georgia. But, you know, here we are in New Hampshire. Guys at the shop that are avid hunters will sit all season and never see an animal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, how in the world do you do that year after year? And, you know, they shoot a deer like once every three years. And, and, you know, they probably have hundreds of hours in for every deer they shoot. No way I would be interested in hunting. I remember growing up and shooting deer when I was younger and like my grandfather's friends or maybe not them. They were shooting stuff all the time, but like grown adults being like, how are you like this kid is 10, 12, 13, whatever it was at the time. being like, I've hunted my entire life and not gotten a shot off on a, on a deer. And like, that's just around here. Like to me, I'm that's like, crazy. I, I shoot one every year. I go out or whatever. And like it, yeah, it's a completely different way. But I think for people here, I mean, what you said about the variety of game. So, um, for years I've I had a lease in Texas and then in, um, Alabama and the black belt there in Alabama and there's lots of deer and, you know, I see deer every hunt and you get spoiled, but still like you're only seeing deer. Occasionally you'll see a coyote or something. Uh, maybe sometimes a pig, but in Africa, what you're talking about is Thomas who has never hunted or been on a hunt until we went to Africa and bless his heart. The second hunt was a Cape Buffalo, (laughs) but, but you know, we would be on a hunt. And so, you know, we'd drive around, spot something, spot and stalk glass, but you could do a spot and stalk and you know, the few hundred meters you got to hike, you might all of a sudden get halfway through that and turn and there's a giant, you know, there's a, a, a kudu bull uh, j- right there. I mean, you might encounter four different things to shoot before you get 300 meters to shoot the thing yeah. you thought you were going to shoot. It's amazing. It mm-hmm. is amazing, the variety of stuff. Like at Safari, I think they've got 20-something animals because it's free-range hunting, 20-something different species of animals that's free-range to hunt that's on their insane. place. So, and the, and the fact that, because, and part of it is they're free range. Part of it is probably, you know, the dollar so strong in South Africa right now. And they were shut down for a year and a half. You couldn't go into South Africa to hunt. So everything got cheap. And like right now you can go over there and stay a week, week and a half in five to seven grand and shoot five to 10 animals. Yeah. And have, yeah, food, lodging, everything. It's Great cheaper. experience, yeah. And it's cheaper than anything you can do here in the States. Has you or have you or anyone you know shot a hyena? Mm, there was a, never. There was a picture that floated, it was floating around recently of a Navy gentleman um, with a, a hyena on a four-wheeler that he had shot, and it is massive. I shot a jackal. Right. So did that guy. That was just, yeah. but that was, you know, in the back of the Bucky and there he is. Wow. Yeah. Same, with, <laughs> yeah. same with that guy. <laughs> same with me. I tell the story like I was in the front seat of the Land Cruiser with this folded in my lap and it ran out in the road in front of us and stopped long enough for me to lean out and shoot it like that fast with a red dot. And, you know, during the day, I mean, just like yours, it's like it's so rare and just happenstance. Um, but no, hyenas, they're not um, like free ranging hyenas they're more north the, right yeah they're not where yeah. where we are in south africa i mean there are places you can shoot them there but i think that's probably high fence places where they have them but yeah. they're not there was yeah, very I, little I, left of this jackal when yeah, I, I, I had a shot it with 375 h and h with <sighs> 270 grain south point and i think i hit it a little bit back and it was like it's two jackals now yeah almost <laughs> cut it yeah down. i mean they're small animals yeah Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I, I got lucky, too, even for a jackal. The one that I shot was incredibly beautiful. Mm. Um, so that's cool because, you know, you can shoot all that stuff there easily at night if you hunt it like a coyote. But, like, man, I'm old. I'm getting up at daylight. We're hunting all day. I don't want to stay up all yeah. night and shoot a bush pig or a jackal. Good reason to hunt Africa in their winter time because yeah. you have nicer daylight hours, way less snakes, way less bugs. 
uh, it's just mu much nicer, yeah. nicer temps. And then also the critters are going to be at the watering holes in, you know, their winter time. Yeah. Uh, so it's nice. Yeah. I mean, by the time this airs, it'll be two months since Thomas and I were there. And so it was winter there, which is so mild compared to where you live now yeah. or where we are here. But, um, you know, so I don't know, it's like 40 to 75 and they were acting like they were going to die, you know. But it was nice. I was telling Thomas, uh, uh, I started asking the, because, the, you know, the PHs will lie to you about this kind of stuff. So I started asking the trackers, you know, the natives, and they're not going to lie to you about this stuff. Is, when's I'm like, Desmond, when's the last time you've seen a snake? He's like, snake? Mm, four months ago. And so, yeah, I mean, there, it gets that cold. The snakes just don't yeah. come out. Not even if you have, like, one warm day at 75, they're like, eh, it's still winter. And that's nice because, like, Jason and Rat almost stepped on, stepped on a puff adder. Right. Well, that Those sucks. are mean right that there. That sucks. Yeah. I don't, I'm cool with snakes, but when they can, like, make you go to sleep forever, that kind of sucks. Yeah, you're cool with snakes because you're not from a place where they have venomous snakes. Right, exactly. I hate them all. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I've yeah. never had a, an issue with them. Like, I mean, being a little, the, the like sketchiest moment I've ever had was in Utah and they have bull snakes that look like a rattlesnake, but they're not venomous. So yeah. when one grabs on you and holds on, you think, oh, well, this we just got bit by a rattlesnake, but scary. that's it. Well, you know, it's funny when we were over there, maybe it was Thomas asked me about, they don't wear snake boots over here. And I was like, nah. And well, why not? It's like, well, because like the snake that's really going to kill you is the mamba and it's going to like bite you in the chest or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. so stands big, up yeah. five feet. It ain't going to bite you when, on the leg, homie. When I first moved over, we, we first moved to Swaziland and I'd go exploring outside of our mode, you know, lawn area. I just remember I was, I was moving at like the Vietnam jungle patrol pace, like, you know, one step every minute or two and looking at everything and, couple of months later i was running through those same areas and it's never yeah i mean when i first started going never an issue. i was so afraid of it and i'd ask the guys and they do the same stuff and before you know it by the end of the first week or two you're there like you're crawling through the bush yeah tracking stuff or you doing you just gotta things. pay attention i mean sometimes sometimes they're <sighs> there so you do have to you do keep your eyes open and i remember uh, talking talk about snakes i was in sniper school and i was getting ready like i had a perfect spot for my final firing position like getting ready like i'd already built uh most of my hide and I, you know the, the way the sun was shining across this bush like i had a nice shadow there so i'm crawling into the spot and i remember looking and i go wow that's a remarkably well-preserved rattlesnake skin <laughs> <laughs> and then it starts moving a little bit but it was like that was my spot like so I start throwing little rocks at it. I'm like, get out of here, snake. This yeah. is my spot. And, like, and it, it, it left. Oh, and it I, did I shot from, that? from there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't. Hey, this is this is serious business. Like, I'm, I might I might not pass this. Was this idea. in yeah. North Carolina? No, this was in Southern California, out in the desert. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. Diamondback. Mm -mm. Forget that. Um. S sniper school. So, so w when did you go through sniper school? Ninety-seven. I was two, or ninety-eight and ninety-nine. So I actually failed the first time I went through sniper school. Not for shooting, for stocks. Uh, basically, the, the standard is you start a thousand, twelve hundred yards away. I would fail for stock. Every you have to get within two hundred yards, plus or minus twenty, and you're milling to, to determine your range. And then, uh, and then you have to take two shots undetected. And after your first shot, someone's going to come within first like five yards of you. And then he gets within three feet of you. And then he actually points at your head. And you have to be undetected the whole time while you take your second blank shot at the guy on bino staring exactly where the guy's pointing. Um, so it's pretty pretty challenging standard uh the first time going through it i was pretty serious about i could have actually made each one of those shots and and i you know got got walked on too many times for uh for stocks and so that was is that what jack, that was crushing to me is that what jacked you um, up being like i need to make yeah, a realistic I, shot? yeah I, I was a little bit more like hey i i could actually probably make the shot so so that meant that 
the maybe I was shooting from 260, you know, 260 yards, mm. where the standard is 200 yards plus or minus 20. I. Uh, so that was that was super hard for me. That was like one of the first like big things that I had failed, and you know, like as I was a fir- uh, one, you know, not even one platoon wonder. I was in my first platoon and got sent there because I was a good shooter, and so I like had to go back to the boss and say, "Hey, sorry, like for shaming our platoon, yeah. like failing this." And yeah. and uh, I mean, it's a, it's a hard school. A lot of guys fail out of it. I did well in the shooting and. And they're like, okay, what, you know, it happens sometimes. And then as soon as I got back from that deployment, like I just kept, Hey, put me back in, put me back in, got to go back in. And I crushed it the second time I got walked on once. And it's because it was, it was out in the desert. And when I got walked on, the guy said afterwards, he's like, I couldn't see you, but there was only one bush there within like 10 yards. So you Mm -hmm. had to have been behind that, which at first I thought was unfair. And then I thought about it. I'm like, well, Actually, it's totally legit. Oh, he's if, doing a good job. If too. there's only one bush there and I'm behind the only one bush, then by default, I have, you know. Yeah. So, but I, I kind of, I played the game the second time through and, and, and passed. I mean, so. and you know, that's probably what they're looking for. Absolutely. I mean, it's all, it, it's, can, can you learn and can you adapt and do it? And I mean, there was, there was some definite, I mean, learning to, to turn your, you're basically, I, I turned my gun into a bush because I, I didn't, uh, you know, you can veg yourself up, but then they're still looking at you. So kind of my SOP was I would get within about 250 yards or so. And then I would just, you know, I, I knew what the predominant vegetation was and I didn't even mess around with rubber bands. I had clippers, little hedge clippers, and I would just start chopping down bush, you know, like branches of a bush that might be like this big. And I would take zip ties and I would take big bundles of it and I would zip tie it onto my bipod. And so I'd have these cross things like this. I'd have then, then, then I'd zip tie a bunch onto my, uh, uh, onto my scope as well. And so I'd yeah. have this giant fan basically of vegetation. Oh, you're looking at it from the front. So yeah. you're looking at it from the front and then That's I would, smart, and then man. I would just from there, I would just scoot up and, and get to where I thought I was within the, you know, keep milling until I thought I was within 200 yards. And then, uh, get to a stable position ideally depending on the the time of the day try and find some shadow and then you just plop yourself up next to a bush in a shadow and man you just disappear you don't even need anything on yourself because you've got this big fan of vegetation in front of you that's awesome there's a there's an instagram account that i've followed for a while called snake pit um and it's all army snipers and they just go over like every now and then they'll post a video of just like how this dude has vegged up his his jack and it's all like the handmade stuff and it's crazy just the the predominant thing that I see is like guys with rolls of um like hair ties, zip ties, things like that like little little things that the average person would never think of but yeah same thing like showing off his tripods and his tripods all it looks like a bush or whatever like it's cool. What what was your setup then firearm wise? Do you remember what you had? Uh, some version of a 700. Uh, I think they had, we had McMillan stocks on them, but it was just a normal 700. And then I had a loophole Mark IV fixed 10 power scope with a mil dot reticle and minute turrets. 100 yard dope was like 44, 43 and a half. And it's like, man, if that thing got bumped and you had to zero it back out, like the bottom was so mushy. It was like, you weren't really sure exactly where you're like, I think this is it, but you could always kind of go one, you know, a quarter minute or more like so past mil, it. Mil so reti- reticle and, and a minute. Yeah. Why would they, that like, was they the still, standard, people man. People still Everyone do that. And that. I don't understand. It, it wasn't really the standard. It was the Navy. <laughs> I think the army was doing the same. Thing. <laughs> oh, were they? Everyone was doing that. I just <laughs> started with I mean, the air force. There are still people that are companies that offer options that are minute turrets and mill reticles, and I really? do not guys, understand it. It's well, it's because guys can't get past you know. So they learned a minute is an inch at a hundred yards, mm-hmm. and so when they go zero their their hunting rifles, they're like oh, I need to come right three inches and up, you know, two inches. Okay, right three up two. And it, that's an easy thing. Once you understand 
mil mil or minute minute which really it wouldn't matter if yeah, it's, if it's you lived in a, a vacuum it wouldn't matter yeah, yeah. A, but what i tell guys is hey you don't live in a vacuum and you are going to train with other people and predominantly everyone is running mill equipment i mean like that, that i've so i have a replica of that rifle that i went through sniper school with and it's got that same fixed 10 power scope on there but i could take that out and i could spot with that scope yeah. with you shooting the most modern you know, to do Razor HD three, what whatever you're you're using, yeah. like you could, I could spot well, for it's you because we're we're speaking the same language. Whereas if I had a minute, you know, a minute reticle, and you have a mill reticle, then I'm trying to do math in my mind, and yeah, and the, that sucks. I yeah. mean, I agree. We we even ran into that some. We were out Wyoming doing some stuff. So, at the command, did you ever? So you deploy as a sniper then like did you oh yeah do the, yeah and, and what was your setup then i had a recce rifle for nine i mean i i so i had i had an sr25 i had a uh i had a wind mag mm -hmm. 50 cal never used the 50 cal uh you didn't shoot any vehicle oh my god i'd have had to shoot something with that 50 do you have to carry it uh, first. Oh. no one no one did anything with the 50s or uh, very few mm -hmm. guys did um but the over Everything guys guys carried recce rifles, which was just our our gunsmiths thrown together all just off of normal Colt guns. You know, I, I believe they're Lalcha, you know, one and eight uh, stainless steel barrels, and then we we're putting the the B Myers flash suppressors on there, and then well, and then and then we had the Opsync can for a while, so mm -hmm. it recessed a little mm -hmm. bit, and then yeah. just the the Knights, you know, Reed Knights quad quad uh, rail tube, and then uh, at the very beginning of the war, we had a couple loophole very power variable power scopes and yeah. as soon as the two and a half to tens became more proliferated it was just all all night force so two and a half to when tens. you guys went to night force yeah and then and two, then yeah i like i have the uh, two and a half to ten they're great scopes upstairs yeah i actually have it on sr25 but i've used it for hunting a ton yeah. it is a great it was way ahead of its time Absolutely. it was compact lightweight um the power range is phenomenal yeah like two and a half to ten is great. it's not that different than my my newest hunting scope from Swarovski is a one point something to 13 but that's wow. just probably oh, yeah. because technology's gotten better but it's that's pretty much the same range but this scope's bigger it's but the actually one power lighter. is 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 good though i mean to me like there's a big to me the, the one you know the, the one to six the one to eight and now the one to ten just killed the two and a half to ten. Yeah. I for me, I I would go three and a half to fifteen. If I wanted, if I wanted something, I wouldn't do any two and a half to tens anymore. I would go three and a half to fifteen if I wanted something a little bit more. Because fifteen power, you're getting a lot. Fifteen power, you're getting a lot more than you are uh, at ten power. Over ten, but I find that even when I have an eighteen power or whatever, you know, maximum magnification scope hunting i rarely use over like 12 power mm. yeah. and i really like having one or one and a half or two once i go to like three power i always want a little less minimum power because whether it's you with that that mountain lion or it's me with the cape buffalo in africa like or the jackal the, the jack well the jackal was like yeah, eight, was 80 or 100 oh. meters but um you, you know, once you encounter something that's inside 50 meters, like I don't want any magnification. Well, and that's where like, so the, the one to 10, which is my current year, the, the HD three, one to 10, that yeah. that's my favorite scope right now. I mean, cause I can make that is that, that's the vortex. vortex yeah. yeah. Um, so it's got a BDC and, or not a BDC, mm -hmm. sorry. It's got a, a, a real Christmas tree reticle in it. So it's got mill and hash half mill hash marks going all the way down. And then it's got wind dots going out, um, and fully daytime visible red dot. So I can make all the standards, same as, as run, if I'm running a T1 or a T2. For, yeah. for up close, if I've got on AR, I can make all the same touch point type shots with it, but then I crank it down, and now when you crank it down, the box gets really tight. tight yeah. But I, for me, it's by exception that I shoot on 10 power. I shoot that thing on one power, on everything out to about 200 yards, and then after that, it's by exception. Now I've got a little bit more time. Now crank it up to you know eight or 10 power. Yeah. Um, but man, what a... How amazing that we go from, you know, two and a half to 10, because there is a huge difference in speed on target at two and a half to 10 than there is on one power. Well, you think with your career, you went for fixed 10 power and then how much of an improvement you can dial everything down to two and a half in a smaller scope with better, with like light way better glass. And yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. And then you go from a 
to a one. So basically, your red dot to the ten power. Yeah, in one package. I mean, and that's in one generation of soldier. That's pretty incredible. You said you ran a T two. Um, did you run that as like a top hat or on a forty five? Top. Okay. Yeah. Cool. The T two. What's the T two? It was a T one at the time. Oh, T one. Yeah. Pre pre T two. The aim point micro. The oh. micro T one. Oh, yeah, yeah, T two. Yeah. Those are cool. I yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. They're good. I like yeah. seeing them on Glocks. The six second mount. That's like my favorite thing. I hit up ALG like, hey, do you guys have any of these? They're like, no, we don't. I had one on a. I put, I put a T one on a, on a. Uh, Unity Tactical. Oh yeah, Adam. Yeah, that was too big, and then and then now and then that was pre, pre Acro, and then now the 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 five hundred nine Ts are mm. that's the I'm, and I'm a big proponent now of running dots on pistols. So they're just I want to it make, I want to make the jump, but I just so 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 fast. so easier. I wouldn't say it's necessarily faster, but it is easier and it works better under you know. I mean, also, I'm a big proponent of having a light on your farm now, on, on your pistol at all times, because they're so small that you can now. <laughs> and these eyes are so bad um, now. Well, and that's another, that's another reason to, put, to I, get a dot gun. I thought dots, I you know, my eyes lasted longer than probably the average person. And at, at 45, I can no longer see 45 years of age, not angle for mm-hmm. your, like, offset some gangsta yeah. shit you're doing. But, yeah. um, once I was 45, I couldn't reliably pick up iron sights very well and then low light which is probably when most like encounters would happen when you need to defend yourself i don't know like i'm pulling that out of my ass but i know with hunting that's when things that's when stuff comes alive eh? yeah and and i could no longer see it used to aggravate me taking ethan hunting and you know on the property ben and i used to lease in alabama the biggest deer we ever saw we're gonna let ethan shoot ethan shoot we're hunting for a few days. Last light, the biggest deer, hundred probably hundred and sixty to seventy inch whitetail comes out free range in Alabama. It's a hundred yards, and Ethan's blind ass could not find it in the scope. Oh man! And I'm like, I could have shot it with iron sights, and I was so upset. And he had a little pole Mark IV on his. I think before we even came home, I, I've told the story in a podcast before. I bought him. Uh, Swarovski Mark VI, which is what he has now to hunt on his hunting rifle. Because I'm like, we ain't doing that shit again. Mm. Um, but then when that started happening to me, that's when I got into dots on sight. So that's, you know, I only started shooting dots on pistol um, a couple of years ago. And I don't really use, like, I shoot pistols because it makes me better at shooting a rifle. And then occasionally, too, if it's a gun that I carry and we're at the range, I want to shoot a few rounds through it. But I don't train like I should. But, yeah, it's got a dot on it now because I, I can't see iron sights. So yeah. then it's just otherwise I'm just pointing and shooting. I think it makes shooting 50% easier well, to what shoot you, with a dot. What do you think about hunting? Like it was interesting to me, and I meant to mention it, when you talked about the cooter. <laughs> cooter. cooter. <laughs> 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 I'm going to get another beer based on that. Uh, cooter. Do you run a 509? Is that what you Yeah. 509, yeah. The hollow Suns. I've, 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 got got I've got a P2 on order. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've probably got four or five five hundred nines on, like on different guns. I like the way the acro looks more, but I'm. Everyone says the hollow sun is great. Yeah. I have not. Big. I have not broken one yet. I had, and I have. Of everyone I know, I think I have one guy that had one show up, kind of dead on arrival, like wouldn't 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 adjust. But yeah, I have, I have a little bit of sympathy for manufacturers now. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's sometimes stuff's yeah. gonna get away from you. When we're talking about when you're talking about the uh, the cooter, cooter or cougar or mountain lion experience a little while ago, when and, and you like brought up the fact that you had your uh, reticle illuminated when you shot, and I find now I started so I went to Swarovski after hunting with a friend that was sponsored by him and got to use his optic, and I was like, oh my god, these are way better than everything else for hunting, like. You know, and this was five or six years ago, just the glass, and it was so much brighter when it mattered in low light. But he had the uh, illuminated versions, the I versions. So these were probably Z6s maybe or Z5s, I don't remember. Um, but their dot was so small and so correct, and they have a lo- low light setting preset to where it's very dim, but in low light you see it. And then they have a daytime setting, you switch it over to the other side, and it's brighter, and you can preset either one. 
But once I went to those and my eyes started to fail me in low light, I would lose the reticle. And so the dot was important. And ever since I learned that now, even during the day, so I shoot with that, I train with that for hunting, but now even during the day when I have full, you know, the sun's at the zenith, it's, I use the dot and it's became so much more instinctive, even with the crosshair and everything I can shoot. I feel more confident and shoot way faster. Yeah, and dots are great. I mean, yeah. they're, they're anything inside of 200 yards, go, go with a dot. And then if you have time, if you're like, oh man, what is that? I can't quite see it. And you can build a solid position, then go ahead and crank up your magnification. And then, you know, then potentially shoot your crosshairs. But I, I mean, even use it with the, the magnification. Like, I love the dot. Um, you know, it just became, and it's probably part of a training aspect. Like, put the dot in this position. Like, I want to shoot it on the shoulder, behind the shoulder. That's where the dot goes. And even when I have a crosshair and I have time and I can dial up, like I prefer it. But, you know, in a situation like you were talking about with the cougar, which happened to us kind of with the buffalo or happened to me with the jackal, you know, one power, my minimum power, if I've got a two power or whatever, I have that dot on and I just throw it up, put the dot and shoot. Um, yeah. It yeah. makes shooting easy. It, I mean, it makes it so much faster for me, for my eye to say, okay, there's the animal, bring the red yeah. dot there, pull the, tr- you know, rather than, you know, the crosshair is black, we place it here. I don't know. It seems faster. I prefer it. Do you use it for just about everything? It depends on, it really depends on what I'm doing. I mean, if I'm, if I'm running, like if I'm running a stress course with, with, with an AR, uh, I run it on one power the whole time with, with a dot on. And, I, I always tell the guys, I'm like, run it on one power with the dot on. And every, you know, every carbine course I do, there will be guys that are like, yo, because we, we, it's, it's a stress course and hey, there's, you know, like there's some stuff on the line to, to win. What, what distances? Uh, anywhere. I mean, it really depends on the range. Some of them might be, uh, you know, the, the majority of the stuff's within a hundred and then there's, you know, a oh. single or a couple 300 yard shots. There might be something like yeah, that. If there's any stress, um, if there's any stress for me with my very limited experience, if we're a hundred and in, I'm only using a dot. Yeah. One I mean, even, dot. even 200 and in what I've found is that the guys or, and, and for myself as well, when I've tried to, you know, quote unquote cheat, cause I'm like, Oh, there's some shots that are further out. I'm going to go ahead. Let's run it on three power it always slows me down because when I present and I'm trying to hunt for, okay, I'm going to shoot this target here and then this target and this target, you just don't have the field of view. So you can't, you know, you can't see as much. You end up hunting for a target to shoot. Yeah. So I really, I'm a big proponent of keep it on one power unless it's like legitimately, it's a further shot that, you know I mean? It's a 300 yard shot. You can still shoot it on that. If, if it's a you know full size or, or even if it's PC steel, because I know, Hey, 300 yards. I just put the dot towards towards the top of his forehead. I'm still going to tag the guy in you know center mass. Um, but if it was beyond that, that would be the time where okay, let's go ahead and dial the thing up and then actually shoot whatever my hold is for that distance. A lot of it, I think, is psychological, and you convince yourself because you have the power you need it for that. I remember not this time with Thomas, but the last time I was in Africa, we got on a kudu and surprised us like it does sometimes at like 50 yards or whatever. And until I know I'm going to take a shot, I tried to be very religious about keeping it on my minimum power or, you know, that's a great thing to do one power. And, um, I had a two and a half to 15 and I had it on two and a half power and the encounter was at like 50 yards. So then the adrenaline kicks in. I didn't get a shot off and we didn't really, I didn't have a good shot and I was shooting a six, five, in a 143 ELDX, so a lead bullet, and I had yeah. to shoot through some brush. I didn't feel confident, so we hauled ass, tried to, and it was close, and the kudu knew something was up, and we tried to reposition to get a clear shot, and if I had had the 8.6, I would have shot it right then, or a 300 wind mag, I would have shot through the bush, but I didn't. And by the time we get in position, the kudu runs, and we had, you know, and by the time I end up shooting, I shot it at 300 yards. And... You know, at the end of all this and the adrenaline, we shot the thing, the thing works out. And I realized like I shot on two and a half power. And then, and thinking back, I was like, oh, I remember thinking, okay, make sure get the dot just bam and worked out fine. But, um, it was very quick, but 
you know, in that instance, had I thought about, like, I didn't think about it at the time. I didn't realize I was on two and a half power and we started at 50, we ended up shooting it at 300. And had I thought about it, I would have been trying to dial my scope up to get more magnification. And I didn't need it. It's like, it took me a second, but like, well, probably realistically half a second to adjust, make the shot and hold and squeeze the trigger and make, you know, and it worked out. I didn't need the magnification. So it is interesting. You get used to having this luxury and you don't have to have magnification inside those distances to make a good shot. You don't. Because a kudu, it's like, even when you talk about a man, like you, okay, so you put on its forehead, you're going to hit it in the chest. Anywhere here in the torso is a good shot on, on, on a person with a rifle. It's like a kudu is like three times bigger than a person. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I need to hit a 18 inch circle for this to work out. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks for stopping awesome. by. Guys. Man. Well, thanks for having me on. It's been yeah, great being here. Yeah. And, uh, That's it, Jay, you got yeah. any wisdom to share? Not like you guys. Is Come, it? On. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Come no. on. What would ODB say? on the one-man army, a song.